and good morning students good morning staff good morning facilitators i welcome you all today to our day four of our fms orientation ceremony so for those of you who have joined us all week i hope you are enjoying our topics and presentations thus far and today we have another lineup of topics for those of you who have not accessed the schedule please remember it's available on the fms ue website First up on our segment this morning, we have an assessment practice for online assessment and PBL assessment. This is facilitated by Professor Vidya Saar. Professor Saar is the Deputy Dean of Quality Assurance and Accreditation, and he's also the head of CMSE. Professor Saar, I welcome you this morning and thank you for our presentation. Thank you very much, Rihanna. So, good morning, colleagues, and good morning to all our new students to the FMS and here I'm going to give you some orientation about assessment practices at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, particularly MBBS, DDS in year one and year two and DBM and how the PBL problem-based learning is assessed. So, if I am correct, yesterday you have learned about what is PBL, how it will be conducted, and how it will be delivered through online mode. Before it used to be face to face in a small seminar room where 10 to 14 students used to be sitting together along with a tutor. But as you know, given the circumstances, we have moved everything online and there is enough research evidence that speaks that online PBL is as effective as face-to-face -face PBL, that is problem-based learning. So I know you are aware of the different steps, different skills involved in the PBL process from yesterday presentations. So here I am going to talk about how we are going to assess those skills, those knowledge that we are delivering to you. Because without assessment, we cannot certify your any of your skills. So that is the key thing because as you know, Assessment is the key of any curriculum delivery. When you talk about assessment, any assignment, any exam, any seminar that is administered upon you and you are then assessed and given some marks, given some feedback. So before that, I just would like to let you know that, uh, just moving. Yeah, so as you know, learning never stops. That was the annou announcement by UNESCO. I don't know, it may be in most of the most of the audience may be knowing what is what is UNESCO. That is United Nation Educational and Scientific Cultural Organizations. Then in our FMS, we say when the learning never stops, it means the assessment also to continue because when learning is taking place, we must continue the assessment because without assessing, we cannot certify you. Now, before that, I would like to mention here the UE mission statement, how our curriculum is in alignment with the our UE mission statement because without mission statement, we cannot deliver what we would like to deliver to the society. So our mission statement is very clear to advance education and create knowledge through excellence in research, innovation, public service, intellectual leadership and outreach in order to support the social, economic, political, cultural and environmental development of the Caribbean and beyond. 
so when we speak all those things it is not lofty words we live up to it through our curriculum through different strategy that we adopt in delivering the curriculum and you should be happy to know that problem based learning it's first introduced in the university of west indies and particularly st augustine campus first in the whole caribbean so we are in a way pioneer of problem based learning in the medical faculty in the whole caribbean which we have been doing for last more than 30 years from the beginning of this faculty since 1989 now what is the fms mission statement to train health professional to meet the needs and improve the care of those whom they serve to strive for excellence while contributing social economic cultural development of the caribbean and inculcating graduate attitude of what lifelong learning the key word is lifelong learning along with ethical conduct and excellence in service and research so we will empower with those skills that after you leave the school also you will have a craze for learning new things because sometime we are graduate and people don't feel like reading books and anything to update their knowledge and this will not happen here we will train you in such a way despite leaving the schools or university you will feel you will crave for learning more and more and this could be done how through problem based learning it promotes that so when i say again why i am familiarizing with all those things because i would like to make you aware these are the facts and these are the pillar stones where the university stands so now the next one third one i am going to talk about the ue distinctive graduates what is that ue distinctive graduate because when we say that what i mean to say here that once you are graduated from ue you will be distinct from any other graduate in terms of what you will demonstrate your critical and creative thinking capability you once we assure you that once you are graduated from the ue you will be a good communicator you will be knowing how to use the it that is information technology we expect that you will be innovative and entrepreneurial at the same time when you will be globally aware of what is going on you will be grounded in the regional identity and all these things will contribute to the social cultural and environmental development in the caribbean for which you will be responsible and it must be guided by the ethical values so why i am saying all those things you e mission statement fms mission statement distinctive ue graduate why once you enter this ue system during your stay whether it is four year program five year program or six year program make sure that you are trained you are empowered and you have all these qualities ingrained in you by involving yourself in different activities different teaching modes different participation whether it is formal or informal with the teachers with the tutors so that you can proudly say that you are a ue product and we can also say that you are a ue product so now this all those things does not happen overnight it is a process it is a gradual process we put you into the processes 
and we expect that when you graduate after four years or five years you are a product in grand with all these qualities now when i say this i would like to say here that you see all those things why i was talking because as a medical professional or a healthcare professional you have to be professional you should be a good communicator you should be a good collaborator you should be a good manager a health advocate and a scholar it is not about only academic knowledge it is more than that so you can see communication collaboration management professionalism all these things are trained while we do the problem based learning so don't think that you can google and get the information everybody can google and get the information but in order to gain these skills of communication collaboration management professionalism advocacy it can you cannot google and learn it you have to involve in the processes and that's why the pbl is i'm trying to make my point and emphasize that you can google and get the information but it is difficult to get trained to be a good communicator because you know that from the day one when the all the speaker came how they were talking about communications ethics professionalism and all those things so no, knowledge medical knowledge is one aspect of to be a health, successful health professionals besides that most of the other attributes are necessary what we call human attributes and that does not come overnight it is a gradual process which will be inculcated when you are in the school of medicine so we will try to inculcate these values these skills when you are here so now coming to here as i say in the pbl process we are talking about assessing these qualities because you know when you are in the pbl process you are going through these steps and every steps you can see these are the different competencies you should be knowing how to select a problem how to define a problem how to raise issues how to develop hypothesis how to formulate learning outcomes identifying the authentic and reliable sources again when you are getting the information it is also one of the skill how to make use of those information how to make or select select the relevant information from the authentic source how to summarize and how to synthesize so you can see it does not all these qualities what i am talking now it does not happen in isolations there is no water tight compartment let's say when you are developing you are not thinking about the different sources no it had a, everything happens simultaneously but we try to assess those qualities so that if you lag behind in any of the qualities we are there to assist you in the process now these are the competencies we are going to assess because these are the things we are going you are going to demonstrate now in order to be a competent pbl performer you should have all these qualities if not we will try to inculcate encourage through the encouragement from the pbl tutor so what i am trying to say here is that if you want to perform actively in the problem based learning tutorial you must have interpersonal skill how why we need interpersonal skill down the line when you will be a practitioner you need to communicate with the patient 
your client we need to communicate with the friends and relatives of your client we need to communicate with the society so imagine that you are full of knowledge with medical sciences but you are not effectively able to communicate with your different stakeholder so how you will feel about that so we realize that in the medical school we realize that and that's why we emphasize that so when you are in the pbl sessions you try to communicate you develop the problem solving ability you should have the learning skills different learning skills and i think in one of the sessions our great colleague dr simons have talked about learning skills your critical thinking when i say critical thinking for the medical professional it is clinical thinking there is a overlapping between the critical thinking and the clinical clinical thinking you have to think critically in a clinical scenario i will not go into that detail because that will be another presentation and it is not for you to discuss now so what i am trying to say all over is that we need all these abilities to in order to perform this task and once you have those abilities in order to perform this task now our task is to assess how you are performing in those area and when you talk about assessment before i talk about the assessment i would like to show you a short video when it comes to assessment how the students and how the teacher feel about it the video is self explanatory i will not be talking about the video i will just show the video and i will move on to the next slide and i will leave to you to understand and to make yourself comfortable with the video here on your computer screen you go with the video
so i will not going to the details it is self explanatory so i would i would we would like to make you feel comfortable with the assessment now what is the assessment because every teacher feels that it is the learning whatever i teach the students are learning it no for the students if i get a grades <clears throat> i will learn it that is the thinking behind assessment but what is assessment and modalities of assessment so when i am not going into very details of it i will just try to make you understand in a simple term all courses you will be learning in the faculty of medical sciences there will be number of assessment task those are called assessment that will be assessing the learning objectives you have been learning so you can see that in all the courses there will be learning objectives so people think that what should i study what should not i study no it is loud and clear what you should study is outlined in the learning objectives and you will be examine on those learning objectives by your teacher but the assessment task may be different for different courses either it may be essay type questions either it may be reports either it may be assignment or oral presentation or any mcq exam or any lab anything it can be anything that you do so that is what we call assessment so now as you know assessment it can be synchronous and asynchronous by this time you know what is synchronous and what is asynchronous and the covid h test or covid 19 has given the lesson about it what is that any assessment that is conducted in real time either it can be face to face or online suppose i will give you one mcq exam now and i will give you one hour time i will ask all your 500 students to do the exam then that is a synchronous exam real time if you come to the lab and i am present there and you are doing the exam that is a synchronous exam if you are sitting in a big examination hall 200 students doing an exam all question distributed you are doing the exam that is a synchronous exam but while you talk about asynchronous exam there is no interaction so it can be virtual or any other mode suppose i am giving you one exam and you take the exam home and after two days you are bringing it home bringing it to me then it is a, it is an asynchronous exam there is no monitoring no proctoring so because of covid 19 we have now also gone for asynchronous exam before it was most of the time synchronous exam now coming to here particularly year 1 medical students i am talking about those who will be taking this course particularly the mbbs dds and dbm and these are the courses you will be offered in the year 1 from both pre and para clinical now coming to here in the pre clinical year 1 and year 2 you will be getting these courses where 30% each our continuous assessment out of this pbl 5% assessment pbl explanation and objective 10% seminar laboratory practical assessment 15% and rest will be 70% final exam that final exam could be multiple choice or short answer question if it is asynchronous and there will be minimum time could be given it may vary from one to other now here i would like to say again 
there is for the paraclinical the same format but there is another assessment modality here what we call progressive disclosure questions i will talk about that now assessment you can see mcq you have done so many mcq so there are two types of mcq i will try explain it there is correct answer type mcq and there is best answer type mcq when i say correct answer type mcq multiple choice question out of four or five options one answer is correct beyond doubt let's say i'm just giving an example which is the capital of trinidad and tobago we say port of spain we say georgetown we say new york we say miami so the correct answer is port of spain but when i talk about best answer type in medicine what happen in medicine or in healthcare professional there is nothing as such absolutely correct answer because it varies from expert to expert so we agree on the best answer based on the how competent expert are agree on the answer so in that case you have to answer that questions am i correct so that we have to do so you may experience correct answer type mcq or you may experience best answer type mcq in your exam i am trying to repeat it again correct answer type mcq one option is correct beyond doubt in the best answer type mcq options may be correct but it may not be correct option a may be more correct than the option b or option b may be more correct than the option c that is what we call best answer type mcq now coming to here emq in exam i am talking about all students now you will be having extended matching questions what will happen there may be more than five options for one answer sorry one questions and there may be one scenario given to you and you will be asked to find the answer on the one column there will be scenario and on other column there will be different answer for the different scenario so you have to match it that is called extended matching questions now another and what we call progressive disclosure question what is that progressive disclosure question so you will be presented with the lab results or any relevant problem with a scenario or case so in the first page you will be asked one question let's say you will be presented a scenario you will be asked one one question based on that scenario then second question more information will be revealed you will be asked more question based on the same scenario but with more information so that's why it is called progressive disclosure question we are disclosing the information about one patient in a progressive manner slowly slowly and based on the disclosed inform information you will be asked questions because when you see a patient whether you are a nurse or whether you are a vet or whether you are a dentist or medic medics when you see a patient the patient does not speak everything one time or the when the patient visit to you in the first visit he or she does not come with the all the report and all the test result so the course slowly slowly it happens in the first meeting you inquire from the patient get the information then you prescribe for the test diagnostic test you get the result and accordingly your decision changes similarly 
in the similar scenario, in the progressive disclosure question, you will be exposed to the information about the same case, same scenario, and you will be asked question slowly, slowly. That is what we call progressive disclosure question. Now, I am coming to the any form of assessment. It depends upon your performance. It is not about the personality. It is about the performance. How you perform the task, whether it is MCQ, whether it is PBL, whether it is lab work, or whether it is clinical setting, how you perform. Because in order to give the marks, what we need? We need the evidence. We need the evidence that you have demonstrated the task. So the assessment is based on evidence, not on feelings. And for a purpose with a clearly defined performance conditions. Let's say when I say performance condition, when you go to the lab, you should put this chemical this much, that chemical that much to get the desired result. So these are the performance conditions. And against a published goal measurable criteria, what are those? Those are your learning objectives. You should perform within the learning objectives. That's why the learning, because we know that how much an MBBS student should learn, a DDS student should learn, a vet student should learn, a pharmacy student should learn, or a nursing student should learn, or an optometrist student should learn. So the learning objectives are already outlined. And those are the criteria against which you will be assessed. Now, assessment is just not about what we call MCQ or seminar or something like that. It is multi multidimensional. You will have continuous assessment. You will have final assessment in a different mode. Sometimes it may be MCQ. Sometimes it may be seminar. Sometimes it may be lab work. We don't know. It depends upon the nature of the course. The course coordinator decided. So let's say if some students are not good at MCQ, they can better perform in the lab work. If some students are not good in the lab work, they can better perform in the seminar. So there is equity. We give the opportunity to perform in different tasks for each and every students. So it is multidimensional evidence. So how you see, once I'm giving an MCQ question, I collect the marks and I collate it. That is one form of evidence. So somebody when ask me why I give 50 marks to Mr. X or Miss Y out of 100, then I can show this is the MCQ question. We conducted it and this is the marks. So that is what we call evidence. Because I cannot just give you 50 for out of nowhere. I need so you need to demonstrate the task. Now, when you talk about PBL assessment or any form of assessment, it is all about not only about the grading, but students think that it is all about grading. No, it is more than that. It is about constructive feedback. If there are some ideas that you are challenged. We will look for how to improve it. If there are something that is within you, they will be looking for what we call how to capitalize it on. The more important thing is that monitoring your learning process, how you are progressing along the line. Then another thing is that finally we will be testing the your ability against the learning objectives and finally and finally we'll be giving the grades. Now, when you talk about the PBL process, through different approaches, the PBL is assessed. But we use one that is what we call tutor facilitator model. 
what happened the pbl tutor will not only facilitate the learning he will also assess the students performance at the end of each course so absence from pbl classes when i say classes online classes or when the time permits it is face to face classes if you are getting without prior excuse if you are absent without any medical evidence it may attract penalty in your overall assessment now as i mentioned it could be 5% assessment for the direct pbl out of the 30% and also each student is assessed what we call individually by the tutor for the each block and for that we have a different criteria now so pbl assessment you will be assessed on the skills attitude and values not basically the knowledge i told you pbl is about the skills attitude and values what are those skills i just talk about communication collaboration participation those are the different qualities we will assess and you will be assessed on a five point scale if you perform very sorry sorry five point scale if you are very poor it will be one and if you are excellent it will be five now i am going back to this slide here why because we are assessing this task how i am trying to relate you can have a look at it and these are the skill or abilities you need to perform on this task now we are trying to assess this here so now if you go to online now our forms are all online so let me just share it with you another slide that will be the pbl assessment so here is the pbl assessment form that is used uh to assess the i'm just trying to open it yeah so yeah thank you for your patience so here is a pbl assessment rating scale this form is available online and you can have a look at it online also we will provide the link so these are the different criteria we have here and you are going to be assessed on this criteria you see all the different programs are listed here and pbl assessment is done here how ability to clarify ability to generate hypothesis ability to generate learning objectives ability to select and sort synthesize and evaluate learning resources cognitive and learning uh, sorry cognitive and critical thinking skill self monitoring skills demonstrating initiative curiosity organization and preparation for group discussion commitment and participation in the group sessions ability to express ideas and use language collaborative decision making skill and team skills and be a global rating skill that will be talking about it so now i would like to share again one more thing with you that will be directly taking you to the website so uh here is what we call the pbl form you see you when you go here you see this is the pbl rating form on the screen and you see the tutor will be using this form to assess you i hope i am able to share the uh, the the website can you rihana confirm it yeah okay so 
these are the different what we call form we will be using for you to assess you so when you go here i will show you the different forms are listed for the purpose of assessment of the pbl now i am going here one is the pbl assessment of the students and the rest of the pbl will be the pbl assessment of the pbl problems students assessment of the pbl tutors students evaluation of the pbl problem and pbl tutor attendance so what i am trying to say here is that in order to ensure the quality of the pbl delivery we make sure that we get the our students assessed at the same time our students have the opportunity to assess their tutor so that we can make necessary steps to improve their tutoring skills at the same time the P students are also assessing the pbl problems so that if there is a, a issue with the problem if there is any issue with the problem we'll try to improve it now coming to here that's just i talked about is that what and now these are the 12 criteria i was just talking about how ability to clarify and define and analyze the problem so you are you should be able to define the problem that has been shared with you in the pbl session you should be able to clarify the problem and so your deep sense of analysis about the problem then you will be assessed on a five point scale now next ability to generate and test hypothesis so whatever problem you will be given you should be able to generate hypothesis and as well as learning objectives from that problem what is that your learning objectives your hypothesis must be relevant to the problem it cannot be just so so as i mentioned you in the beginning you should have all these qualities because you will be assessed against this quality and at the more importantly you need this quality in order to perform in an effective way in the pbl sessions and overall the most important thing is that all these qualities will be inculcated during your stay in the medical school so that when you reach when you graduate you are a full ue distinctive graduate with all these qualities now you see when you google it you have so much of information you cannot imagine now also you google it you can get so many information so much information about surgery medicine nursing whatever you name it the courses are available but the most important thing is that how you get the information from an authentic source the source of the information is very very important and after that what are you able to use that information making the information usable that is the key thing you may have bulks of information but if you are not able to make the information usable that does not make any sense now what next we will be assessed on the cognitive and critical thinking skill you know this is very critical when you are talk about critical thinking we refer to the clinical thinking how do you clinically think in the clinical setting when you are on the site so we will be testing this skill during the pbl sessions and you should be able to demonstrate these skills in order to attract reward for your performance now self monitoring skill what is that you must be aware about your strength and weaknesses in the learning and you monitor your thinking when i say that what let's say you are working in a group 
and somebody is talking there talking about some learning objectives you are not able to control yourself you are speaking over that person you don't know how to communicate your thinking you are thinking right but you got impatient and you just throw your thought over other thought so you are not respecting you are not able to monitor your thinking capacity so when you work in a group you should have that skill developed now other thing ability, ability to demonstrate initiative curiosity and open mindedness you know what interesting thing about the present day health practice is that it is no more one man army profession here the professional work in a team setting you just imagine if you are doing a surgery there is surgeon there is pharmacist there is nurse there is anesthetist so many people are involved besides that when you are working in a hospital setting it is not only doctor and patient you have to deal with your administration also whom you are working so you must be open minded you must be showing the interest to listen to others you must have curiosity to know about others knowledge or skills whatever you say this is very very critical we try to assess it now organization and preparation for group sessions what is that you know how a professional life is organized so that's why when there is a group activity you should be able to demonstrate that how much you are organized how much you are prepared for the task that you have given how much you are punctual how much you are present in the session when i say this what i mean is that this is a platform you get to train yourself in such a way that will help you in the future practice so what i mean to say here when you are in a small group setting you may be distributing the task the group leader may be distributing the task so make sure that you are performing your task more appropriately diligently honestly because if you are not performing your task you are not only damaging yourself you are keeping back the group the group will be suffered because of your non compliance with the group norms so this thing also we try to observe in the pbl how much you are supporting the group now the same thing i'm talking commitment and participation in the group sessions participate but participate with constructive comment not like just whatever you comes to mind and talking you know with no relevance to the topic so that you are really involved in the group with your intense commitment and make sure that your activity your actions are contributing to the harmony of the group and most importantly sometime you are you may be sometimes intolerant no you should be having the patience to hear others there may be shortcomings nobody is perfect in this world so if somebody is something doing wrong give him or her time to improve it because if you don't do that the person will not know he or her mistakes so this is the key thing here now again this is a very very critical thing that we try to assess in the pbl what you see when you get to the medical field when you open your books when you open your study material 
you will find so many strange word having written in different spelling but pronounced in different way so when you are working with the group with the pbl tutor or teacher you will get to know how to pronounce different medical terminology correctly and when you know that what will happen you will be in a better position to express your ideas clearly to the other parties involved so that's what i am trying to say the pbl is not just about learning objectives it is more than that you got to know so many things so many activities you do that will prepare you for a better professionals now collaborative decision making skill you know how it is important these days as i mentioned it is a team work so you should contribute so when it is that when you are sharing the objective you are discussing with the your your your, your peer group you reach to a consensus there may be differences but ultimately you reach to a consensus by integrating the ideas of the different members of the group into the discussion and most important is what you must be willing to listen others because listening skill is very very important for health professionals particularly i am talking about because if you listen something wrong and perceive something wrong from your client you may commit medical errors in your decisions which may be life threatening so active listening is a very very critical requirement for a medical professional for health professionals any health professional when i say health professional whether it is dentist pharmacist mbbs dbm nursing anyone you must be an active listener you cannot just think about something and just ignoring the talk what is they are talking team skill i already mentioned it you must show it to the commitment to the group task because there may be different learning style in your group by different members so try to value their learning style everybody will not have the same learning style in the way you learn so you should respect their differences demonstrate tolerance and at the same time you must give constructive criticism not destructive criticism constructive criticism so that the team member may improve in each or her ability what did i say in the beginning assessment is not all about grading it is all about monitoring constructive feedback that will empower you that will help you to develop the different skills and abilities most important thing is the feedback that you give to members but the last only comes the grading but people think that oh assessment is always about the grading no it is not so it is more than that so as i say i explain all the 12 criteria how you have to de demonstrate and overall in all this quality how you are where you stand are you still learning or are you an example of a pbl participant it all depends and the pbl tutor will assess you on that so the whole idea is that when i say all this criteria it is your right to be informed that on what criteria you will be assessed now you know on what criteria you will be assessed the other thing is that all these skills we don't expect you to develop overnight or in the first session of the pbl that's why the assessment is there we would like to see all those skills develop gradually within you 
not in one session or two sessions during your stay of the medical school or nursing school or any school you are registered we would like to see it is developing you are growing as a student you are growing as a learner now i told you all these forms are available i told you after the pbl assessment by the tutor of the students i told you each group they will be required to evaluate each pbl problems in each course so you are supposed to evaluate each pbl problem i will show you the form it is available online then again in the selected 5% of the pbl you also be assessed so in that form you have to give explanation of the 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 hypothesis where you will be assessed now again you will be assessing the tutor but before that i would like to say you when you will be giving the pbl problem explanation what will happen you will be assessed on the basis of the correctness of your explanation you will be assessed on the basis of clarity how much clearly you are explaining the problem how much relevant your explanation is and the quality and nobility the newness in your explanation accordingly you will be done so as i mentioned students are also required to evaluate their pbl tutor on a specified pbl tutor evaluation form and finally it is therefore imperative for you to participate in the pbl if you don't express your thinking and understanding you miss out on improving your communication skill using the correct medical terminology having your ideas tested by the group so if you miss out on learning and or growing as an individual now before that i end i would like to share the website where you will see this clearly about the pbl form so here on your computer screen you see there is one here it is uh can can you see the screen yes sir yes sir yeah so the the forms are listed here preclinical students evaluation form students pbl evaluation form paraclinical pbl tutor attendance can you see all these forms yes yes, yes sir yes so yes, after sir. that what i am just trying to go on the same screen yes sir yes so when you go to the home screen in the home screen you 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 pull the screen there you will see here students resources and you see the pbl problem so here when you click here you will find all the form beside that i would like to take you another one here you will see there is one we call medulink medulink is a cross campus newsletter as you know mbbs is offered in barbados jamaica bahamas and here so this is a cross campus newsletter where if you will feel like reporting any of the activities you can go here and look into it and you can also contribute to this medulink newsletter which is shared across the campus this is for your information so with that i end my presentation on the pbl assessment so if you have any questions and queries feel free to come so i am looking for any questions or comments if you have any feel free to come if not you always talk to your course coordinator or the pbl tutor communicate with them any doubts they will clarify you not a problem at all and other thing is that make sure that you are attending all the sessions as i mentioned if you missed a session you are missing as a learner and growing as an individual so this is the key thing i would like to mention about the pbl assessment 
and as you know without assessing we cannot certify you and uh, one more important thing i would like to mention that our all the programs particularly mbbs dds dbm all the programs are accredited program that is cam hp accredited program so you have to serious in your whatever the exercise is done in your school and make sure that you address all the concern about your curriculum now with that if there is no questions and comment i am going to introduce our next speaker uh thank you so much everyone for having a patient listening to my presentations hi good morning good morning dr feron how are you today i'm doing well how are you good good so thank you very much dr feron to uh, orient our students about a very important topic that is all about what we call planetary health and now i would like to invite dr feron who is currently an assistant professor for global health at the university of maryland baltimore graduate school he is also the director of the centro inter americano para la salud global in costa rica he acts as an associate director for the planetary health alliance at the harvard th chan school of public health and as well as adjunct faculty at the university of costa rica and department of oral health policy and epidemiology at the harvard school of dental medicine he is also a fellow of the central american health initiative so dr feron is going to talk about today with you about the planetary health and the future of life on earth but as you know the far reaching changes to the structure and function of the earth natural system represent a growing threat to human health and yet the global health has mainly improved as the changes have gathered pace so the point here is that we are talking about particularly the planetary health ecological influences on the health system because when you talk about health health is a state of complete physical mental and social and ecological well-being not merely the absence of disease personal health involves the planetary health now i will hand over you to the our featured speaker dr feron so welcome dr feron thank you so much for coming over here thank you professor sa for that introduction and uh Good morning, everyone um, that's tuning in uh, from the university. Um, I, I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate the opportunity to to uh, speak of this important topic. I'll be overviewing today the topic of planetary health, and that was a really well really well chosen words um, by Professor Sa. Um, as he said, my name is Carlos Alberto Fairon Guzman. I am a Costa Rican, born and raised. Um, Uh, I visited uh, the campus uh, two years ago before the pandemic, and I think February. I was really pleased by the invitation and to to get to know the campus. So um, again, it's a pleasure to reconnect with with some of you in the in the in the audience, and some of us, some of you might have um, actually participated in that Planetary Health Caribbean conference uh, two years ago. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Actually, right now I'm calling not from Costa Rica, where I live and work for the most of the year. I'm calling in from Michigan, where I'm attending a conference. So if you see some background noise or hear doors coming in and out, I'm in a boardroom. Uh, I kind of stole this space to be able to be uh, in silence while while I speak to you. So it shouldn't be a long uh, conversation. Uh, I hope that this is uh, useful for your introductions uh, of of your uh, kind of multi professional. a day that you're having or week introductory week that you're having so 
Um, uh, so as I said, we're going to try to understand the concept of health in this era that we call the Anthropocene, and I'll explain those concepts in this uh, uh, introductory slide in a second. I want to lay out um, the foundations of what planetary health as a science is, uh, but first I have to speak to where we are and what moment of the history we are and why this concept of planetary health came to be. So I'm going to start with some slides that you might have, some graphs that you might have already be aware of. Some of you might have already read uh, uh, some of these things, but I'm just going to do a broad overview. So we always start this story uh, here, right? So when you look at this graph, uh, it, it's clear that uh, there's, there's, there's been some radical change in the world in the last 200 years, right? So uh, just to remind you that it took humans around 200,000 years, right? Our species, Homo sapiens, has been around roughly 200, 250,000 years, depending on where you read it. And it took us as a species uh, around 200,000, give or take, years to reach the population of 1 billion. That is 1,000 million people. But it only took us around 200 years to multiply that number by seven. So it really tells you that population growth is a thing. It is a real thing. And it's happening in an exponential manner. That term exponential has come uh, has become very uh, prominent in, in COVID phases because have we seen COVID cases shot up. So uh, the way uh, population growth has been happening is what we call an exponential growth, especially after uh, 1950 or what we call the post-Second World War uh, era in which we saw an increment of several fold of the population and where we are right now, approximately 8,000 million or 8 billion people, right? Uh, but despite that, despite the population growth, we've also seen an increase in the quality of life that I'm going to summarize in these two points, poverty and life expectancy. So as you recall, uh, if you might recall, uh, before the pre-industrial era, most people in the world lived in poverty. Most people in the world did not have their most basic needs met be it nutritional needs, access to health, be it access to nutrition, access to quality housing, whatever you wanted to look at, there were the majority of people in the world were living under that poverty line. Their basic needs were not being met. Only a few people had that, probably aristocrats, probably some part of, of the bureaucracy of some governments that were starting to be created, probably some people that had means of powers, monarchies, other people of commerce, but the vast majority lived under poverty. As you can see, the percentage of people, percentage of people living under the poverty line, right, has drastically increased. And you can see how this drop is even sharpened again uh, from the 1950s onward. And again, uh, so this is important. This is, so I summarize quality of life improvement under these two uh, categories, poverty and life expectancy. And although we do feel that poverty is getting worse, what's actually increasing, right, in some parts of the world is the gap between the rich and the poor. So the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer. And there's a really good book on, called The Bottom Billion, a little bit old now, but The Bottom Billion really speaks about this gap, wealth gap that is happening in, in, in the world. And despite, again, some of the current health challenges that we've encountered, uh, despite that, there has been an actual increase globally in life expectancy, whereas in no longer than 100 years ago, 50 years ago, a lot of the people uh, uh, perished or the life expectancy uh, of, a, of a given nation or a given region in the world was as low as 35, 40. Right now, the average is over 60 with the highest being countries like Japan, Spain, over 82, 84, 85 years of age. Uh, and, but that increase has only come even in those nations in the recent century. So this is where we are with these three graphs. But these th three things are not happening in a vacuum. Some of these other changes are also to be noted. And let me just get rid of uh, annotations. 
some of these three things are also to be uh, uh, highlighted uh, uh, with, with regards to how change has been happening in the last uh, century. So as you can see, we have been growing in, in population. We have been growing in our quality of life, but we've also been using more resources. And this is the summary of these graphs. We've been using more resources, be it primary energy, be it water, be it land and soil, be it the amount of fertilizer that we have to inject to that land and that soil in order to grow efficiently, uh, the amount of crops that we need. We've been using resources such as the forest for different reasons, be it for land, uh, land, land use change, for building cities or for building cattle ranches or to, to build a, a, a cropland, be it for humans or for animals. And we've been also overexploiting our oceans. So this is the amount of resources that these changes have been uh, uh, causing. And that has at the same time, right, those changes in the use of resources has also changed how we look at our atmosphere, our biosphere is effectively changing. Uh, we are using more water than, more fresh water than we can actually uh, capture. And a lot of that fresh water now cannot be put back into fresh water uh, reservoirs, uh, because of the increasing amount of CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions that we're pumping into the atmosphere, the oceans are getting more acid, and that uh, added to pollution, sediments, loss of biodiversity is only making the ocean more and more and more acid, which is not good, and it's something that we don't want. Acidification of ocean usually means loss of ecosystems, uh, like important ecosystems like corals, and a country like the Caribbean, like the Trinidad and Tobago might, as, as you might be very, very aware of these changes that are happening. We are changing the temperature and the mean temperature that is global warming is actually something that is becoming more and more an a threat of a threat. And again, countries of the Caribbean can feel it more, especially if you're in the Gulf region where the hurricanes due to ocean warming are becoming more and more stronger and biodiversity is being lost at a very, very astounding rate. So as a summary, when you put all these things together, and I remember I had a, a, a biostats professor, which would sell, tell me, make sure you're telling stories with your numbers, make sure you're telling stories with your graphs. So the, the stories that were being told with these graphs here, and the stories from these graphs can be summarized very simply. And the story that I tell my that I tell my students when I'm looking at these graphs is despite, despite the fact that we have grown as a, as, a, as a species exponentially, we've managed to increase our quality of life. That is the first part, right? The first three graphs that you see. However, however, we're doing that at the expense of changes in our natural systems and how we use resources. So that is the story, the summary that is being told in this graph, that despite the fact that we're growing, our life quality is expressing, is increasing. However, we are doing it at the expense of our natural resources and changing our atmosphere and biosphere. So that's what I want to kind of summarize. And that's where we are. And this has consequences. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, right now. Now, as you can see, a lot of these resources, it's not really telling me if this is good or bad right now. This is not telling me if there's a limit to water use. Is there a limit to domesticated land? Is there a limit to carbon dioxide emissions? However, a team of researchers from the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, main, mainly led by uh, 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 Dr. Johan uh, Rockström, which you might have heard that name. He now has a famous documentary in Netflix. If you haven't seen it, go see it uh, on 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 limitary on planetary boundaries, which is what a, a, what this what this a graph is about. He took those graphs that I just showed you and put them on where should we be aiming to not overshoot, right? So if we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, what is a safe? space. If we're talking about biodiversity loss, what is a safe limit? If we're talking about nitrogen and fertilizers, what is a safe roof to that limit? So how, how, how far away are we from overshooting that change 
that are that are uh, expressed here before it becomes unsafe for humanity to live in this earth. So he mapped that out with a bunch of researchers around the world, and he came up with these nine planetary boundaries. And this is what we call the nine planetary boundaries of safe living. So as you can see, the green, you see, is below the boundary. In yellow, it says in zone of uncertainty, where we think there is increased risk to our species. And then in red is beyond zone of uncertainty. Now here, the risk is high. So anything that is in red means that we already overshot it and we're already seeing the negative consequences and reversing that damage will likely be hard or take centuries. So things like nitrogen and phosphorus that are found excessively in fertilizers. So anyone that's into agriculture or that comes from an agricultural family or has worked in a farm will know that all fertilizers have nitrogen and phosphorus. It is the amount we're overly exceedingly injecting that into our crops to make them grow faster. And that is also where, and the plant can't actually use all that much. So most of that actually ends up in the soils or in the rivers or in the oceans, causing severe damage to the waterways in the form of eutrophication. And I won't go into what that term means. Some of you might know if you're studying ecology or basic biology or, or even veterinary or limnology, or if you're in one of the uh, ecological sciences, you, you'll know what I mean. So that is something that we already overshot. The other thing we've already shot is the loss of biodiversity. As you might have heard in the news, we're losing biodiversity at a rate that is much higher in any part of the uh, archaeological evidence we can find. So in any part, there's been some mass extinctions throughout the, the 4,000 million year old history of Earth. There's been mass extinctions. We are facing a mass extinction of species. We are losing species around 100 times faster than the natural rate. And we mostly see this in what we call kind of these famous species, right? We see the last rhino go away. We see maybe uh, the last golden frog go away. What we don't see is a bunch of species. There's around 9 million species in the world that are being lost uh, totally. And of those 9 million, we probably don't even know a fraction of them. And we can't even understand what we're losing right now. But then there's others like climate change. As you can see, climate change in this yellow area of uncertainty. We are now starting to see right, the changes in the, in the climate and how those are impacting uh, human health. And there's, we, we could give a whole lecture on changes of health related to climate change. But as you know, some of the most overt and clear ones are things like forest fires, things like hurricane season getting stronger, things like sea level rise, all those things are related to climate change and health. Uh, then the, the aspect of land change use that I was talking about, the aspect of fresh water use, and then there's others. This one we've actually managed to reverse, the stratospheric ozone depletion. The whole, I don't know if some of you are, 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 are old enough, but in the, in the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of conversation around uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, and how we were injecting a lot of those in the air, and those were uh, 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 kidnapping um, ozone molecules in the in the atmosphere and creating a big hole in the atmosphere. That is finally being reversed because of global legislation preventing the use of CFCs in in industry in, industri in industrial and uh, home products. So this is the planetary boundaries, and I want you to keep this graph in mind as I advance in 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 my conversation. The thing is, the thing is, right, that some of these trends we can already project are not going to change unless we do something drastic about it. So just by the means of population growth, if we want to keep most people in the world with a healthy nutrition, right, and we're talking that by 2050, we're already going to be around 10 billion that is 10,000 million people, we know that water demand would grow. Given today's constraints, we already know just because of the demand of more people, that means more water use. And also things like land use change will use. Cities will grow. And grains like rice, cassava, uh, uh, corn, soy, etc., will take up more land. So just by that, that also means more fertilizer. That probably means more greenhouse gases. And we can kind of trickle down 
how just the aspect of population growth can mean that there's going to be more resource use. Now, I don't want to say, and this is not what I'm saying, the main problem here is not the fact that population is growing. The main problem is how we use the resource available. It is a, a, a question of distribution of that resource. Right here. Watch some of yours. I'm sorry. If someone, if they can mute your microphones, okay. thanks. So it's not an issue of distribution. It's not an issue of total resources, but an issue of distribution of resources and an, a matter of inefficient use of resources. So you have countries that are over exceeding their share of resources, and we call this environmental footprint. And anyone here can go and measure their environmental footprint. I'll give you a heads up. Trinidad and Tobago is not doing well in the use of environmental resources, especially because of your uh, highly dependent economy on oil. And then uh, uh, the other thing is the distribution, how equal, e e equi equitable are we distributing the resources? Why do we have countries with high rates of obesity? Let's say, let's say countries like the United States. Why do we have countries still with malnutrition, starvation? Obviously, these are questions of social justice and equity that we look at in planetary health. So because of all these changes that are happening in our uh, natural systems, our biosphere, uh, it, we, we've actually come to understand this drastic rapid change as a new era. And as I said, Earth, kind of the planet, it is estimated, best guess, guesstimation, to have around 4,500 million years. And as I said, humans have been around around 200,000 years. Now, the last ice age, right, the last Pleistocene, right, ice age, was around 12,000, 15,000 years ago. And from that moment on, from that ice age on, the climate has been, and the natural systems in this earth have been stable enough to allow the thriving of human civilization, right? All the civilizations we know, Egyptian, Babylonian, a, a Indus Valley civilizations, and everything that stemmed from those are only have only been around in the Holocene, which is this stable a, a time in which human civilizations have been able to thrive. Now, of that 10,000 years, from the start of the Industrial Revolution, right, we're talking about the 1800s, that is 200 years, humans have caused so much change, so much change into our natural systems that geologists, the people that actually make up what is an, an epoch, what is an age, what is a uh, uh, and, and one of these tri Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, etc., the ones that come up with those names and those boundaries are now saying that we're in this new epoch called the Anthropocene, literally the age of humans. That's what Anthropocene means. And as a consequence of this Anthropocene, right, uh, as a consequence, we are now seeing effects on not just other species, but our species as well. So that's what planetary health tries to do. It tries to understand what are those changes, what is causing those changes in, in the environment and in, in our natural systems and how those changes are affecting human health. Now, it, um, and that's basically what we mean by it. So when people ask me, what is planetary health? I tell them it's two parts to the definition of planetary health. The first part is that understanding component, right? The fact that we are changing Earth's natural systems, that is humans, or what we say, anthropogenic changes to Earth's natural systems. And we try to understand those changes and how they're linked to human health, right? And then we try to use those understandings, which is the second part of the definition, to find comprehensive solutions. Now, the field of planetary health has been around probably five or six years, but its core tenants have been around sometimes even for thousands of years if we look at indigenous populations and their wisdom and their relationship to the land. So again, we borrow a lot of concepts from things like systems thinking, ecology. We borrow, we borrow a lot of, uh, of knowledge from traditional knowledge systems, like I was just saying, from indigenous knowledge systems. But we also 
borrow from the social sciences to understand how movement building happens, how policy happens, how economic systems uh, work. We also borrow from philosophy, ethics, moral, to understand what are the moral arguments behind planetary health, the ethical uh, conundrums, the social justice aspects of this work. And because of that, right, because of that, then uh, uh, this is what makes up the, the field of, 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 of planetary health. And I'm going to quote here uh, one of my uh, uh, bosses, uh, Dr. Sam Myers from the Planetary Health Alliance, Harvard, in which we have this paradox in which until now, until now, human health and human well-being or quality of life has been increasing. However, that has come at a cost of ecological degradation. Now, we are in a point where we are going to see this trend reverse, where human health is actually going to start diminishing as well as our ecological degradation is going to start diminishing. So increasing, I mean. So both these arrows, and this is where we are right now, we're in a turning point where this arrow is likely going to start turning down as we've, as, as we've been seeing in our a, 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 a current environment of, of, of the news, right? And then there's this other paradox in which, again, we see this increase in economic growth, which sometimes trickles down to human well-being or uh, well-being. But again, we're doing it at the cost. And this doesn't have to be this way. These two things can grow together. And that's the whole point. These two things can grow together. We have to decouple how we understand economic growth and how we understand well-being. And we cannot keep doing this. We cannot keep hurting our environment at the cost of economic growth. And we have to demythify the fact that these two can't happen together. These two can happen together. And there's examples are all around the world on how this can happen. Costa Rica being one of the most prominent examples of that. And this is what we have. This is what I've been saying. This is what I'm trying to summarize here. And this is, an, this is a modified graph. We, I just worked on this last week of what planetary health is. So just to explain to you all at home what this means is first we have underlying drivers, the causes of the causes of the causes of the causes, right? What we call a root analysis, the whys of the whys of the whys. We have things like overconsumption. Right? But we also have societies that value that overconsumption, that actually glorify consumption, that the more you have means the more happy you are. Now, that is a capitalist value. That is a value of capitalist societies, which most of the world lives in. So I signal here that societal values are actually a driving factor. The fact that we're allowing these things to happen and we just kind of wash our hands and say, let's just let the next generation deal with it. That is a societal value that is under driving all the other changes that are happening. There's a consumption aspect. I said, I would call this hyper consumption beyond just consumption. Societies like where I interface in the West, in my country, the more you have, the more triumphant you are. Now we must decouple those two concepts. The fact that we have a growing population is also uh, an underlying driver. However, it's not the only one. It's not to say we must stop population growth. It's more about distribution of resources. And then the fact that we have new technologies emerging, things like in the last 200 years, the use of fossil fuels are also shaping and how we get basic primary energy are also shaping uh, 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 these. Now, these underlying drivers drive these ecological drivers of, of health change. Things like global pollution, the fact that we're losing biodiversity at an astounding rate, our altered biogeochemical cycles, what I was talking about, phosphorus, nitrogen, et cetera, how we've used, how we changed land use, how we use, how we change the use of land, how we are now a, 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 a overusing things like freshwater and the changes in our oceans. All these things are happening interconnectedly. They're not happening one thing is happening connected to the other. So if you think, think things like global pollution and how it's affecting our oceans, you think of climate change and how that is affecting biodiversity loss. And you can create 
basically a web on how these things are connected. Now, these things drive these proximate causes of health change, things like the quality of the air we breathe, the a, a, a presence of harmful substances like metals in our waters, uh, plastic in our oceans, etc. right? Things like how soil degradation, uh, uh, climate change, uh, it's the a, a loss of biodiversity can uh, change how we produce food and how we access food, how these things are also leading to migration and displacement. You think of a country right there in the Caribbean like Haiti and how natural disasters have changed migration patterns. You go to countries, island nations, small island nations, the Caribbean, and you see how sea level rise is changing the pattern of economic and migration uh, 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 patterns in, in, uh, in those islands. You see more exposure to infectious diseases. We have things like Zika, dengue, chikungunya re-emerging in Caribbean nations. We have uh, diseases that were eradicated before, like malaria re-emerging in some countries and in, in Central America because of different climatic and biodiverse elements that are driving uh, mosquitoes like the Anopheles or mosquitoes like the Aedes aegypti to, to be present more and more. You have the aspect of natural hazards, like as I was saying, more floodings, more droughts, more hurricanes. You have uh, problems with access to fresh water. You have the aspect of aesthetics of nature. And then you have some unknowns that we still don't understand quite clear. And again, leaving these unknowns here is really, really important. And then we have modifying factors, right? We have modifying factors like our own genetic makeup, what gender we are, what race, what ethnicity, what level of education, what access to health education, what access to health systems that are resilient and, and, and flexible. We have aspects of governance and societal values that are all modifying if all this is going to be good or bad for my health, right? So it is very different to be a Haitian that lives in poverty that is a woman that has been displaced from their original land. And then you have issues of food access, right? It is very different to be that person and how that's going to impact your immune system and your vulnerability to things like malaria or shigella or uh, 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 parasites, other parasites, how that's going to influence your mental health, your reproductive health, right? It is very different to be that person than to be a high income woman in Florida, in Miami, that at the site of the first hurricane can take a plane, go to New York, stay in New York for a couple of weeks, ask, access the best food possible in New York, access the best healthcare system possible, right? And not be altered by a change in our natural systems. So we can do that with any example, with any person in the world, and how these modifying factors determine if your health outcome will be positive or negative, given the changes in our natural systems, right? And some of those changes relate to exposure to infectious disease, like I said, non-communicable disease patterns as well as we're changing our food systems, we're changing what we're exposed to and what we eat, and our societal values are changing. So we have changing patterns of non-communicable diseases, we have changes in nutritional diseases, mental health and reproductive health. So all these things summarize the framework of planetary health. And of course, like anything we do in current economic system, there's winners and there's losers. Some people are benefiting from this and some people are actually taking the brunt burden of these benefits. So although the economy is set up to not be a zero sum game right now, in our current model, as some win, some lose. That is, the activities that are disrupting the environment, this is palm oil, palm oil, are affecting the populations that are local. Some people might say, oh, but they're providing jobs. Yes, that's true, but they're being exposed to chemicals. Their water are being contaminated. Their food pathways are being lost. Their nutritional status is changing. And what type of jobs do we want for the world as well? We have to ask, is this just that this is hard labor that is literally breaking their backs, literally uh, uh, putting them in bed, uh, literally uh, and giving them no social guarantees? So again, the winners and losers, it's important to, take, to, to ask this question, who wins, who loses with our, with our choices? And that really determines that aspect of equity 
in, 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 in social justice in planetary health. Just like this example, where who emits more carbon? Who emits more greenhouse gases? And although this is old, it is actually just increased now. China's bubble has increased in greenhouse gas emissions. And although they're shifting to greener en energy, for the most, their energy still very much comes from dirty coal, dirty uh, petroleum, dirty uh, fossil fuels. The United States, as you can see, is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. But who will suffer from this? Who will suffer? So it's not the ones who emit that suffer. It's actually the ones that emit the less, the ones that are more vulnerabilized, the ones that have less access to technology, the, less, the ones that have a, a weaker immune system, the, le the ones that have less access to quality nutrition, etc. So there's an aspect of social justice embedded into planetary health that we must take into, uh, into account. And then there's this element of surprise that you read, unknown elements. And as we are studying planetary health, we've come to understand more and more and more of this. Now, 10 years ago, no one would have assumed that because of the higher concentrations of CO2, and this is some research that Dr. Sam Myers has done, so I'm borrowing him from, from his research, that the higher the CO2 level in the air, the lower the quality of the food. So not only are we seeing less yields from basic grains now, but we're also seeing that the nutritional components of those nutrients, of, of those foods, of rice, maize, or corn, soybean, wheat, etc., are actually lower, lower. So things like zinc, iron, protein amounts in these crops are actually dropping. And what does that mean for the majority of people that are living just above, just above maybe a malnutrition, def a, 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 a micronutrient deficiency? What, what does it mean to that, that kid that is growing up and it's just above, just managing to not have anemia? When you lose this amount, this amount of iron in your, pro in your almost only meal, let's say, your wheat, your rice, your maize, your staple, you're bound to fall at anemic levels. And then the consequences of that are still to be calculated and are still to be known. So this will affect millions of people around the world. As it says here, around 200 million people are going to push into zinc deficiency. By several hundred millions will be pushed into anemia, protein deficiency, et cetera. Now, we didn't know this. So planetary health is trying to shine a light in some of these uh, uh, questions. Now, I told you to, re to remember this graph from the Roxham group. And this is telling us what is our ceiling? What are the boundaries we must not pass? But then comes this contribution from Kate Raworth, an economist uh, uh, from Britain, which says, yes, pay attention to the ceilings. Pay attention to the boundaries we must not surpass, but also pay attention to the floor we must not miss. There must not be a shortfall of this social foundation. So not just the ceiling, but the foundation. We must secure things like basic human rights, like water, food, shelter, health, gender parity, social equity, peace and justice, quality work education, we must not forget that if we're going to set goals on what not to overshoot, we also must set goals on what to not undershoot or the shortfall, right? So, and so she draws this donut, what we call the donut uh, uh, of planetary health, the donut of, of economy, in which she paints this picture in which this is what we have to aim for. This is where the safe and just space for humanity exists. And when you look at things like the social uh, sustainable development goals that you must all be aware of, you'll see a clear resemblance on the language that is being used. This is the space where we have to fall. Now, as a student, if you want to learn more from this, there are now two books on planetary health. The next book coming out next week, actually, this was the first textbook, Planetary Health, Protecting Nature to Protect Ourselves. There's a lot of books, uh, good uh, books on the Anthropocene, 
uh, that, that have come out from different lenses. You can kind of go back and, and look at them and, and see if they're available. This is a, a fully uh, free, oh, where is this? This one's a free resources that you can find in our website around planetary health case studies and water solutions that we're starting to look at uh, uh, on, 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 uh, on the challenges that we're facing. There is this resource, the Planetary Health Education Framework. If you want to be a learner in planetary health, you can go to our Lancet publication uh, and, and our website and, again, read the framework and, and understand better what uh, we're supposed to be learning. So just to summarize that to you, this is what planetary health education entails. It entails learning about the Anthropocene in health, so what I've been talking about. But it also entails how to enact change from the movement building science how to use an equity and social justice lens to do that, and how to use a system thinking lens to connect all those things together while, while being deeply informed or your values being informed by the fact that humans and nature are not set apart. We are one with nature and understanding that concept is incredibly important to changing what we want. So how do we get involved? You can participate in our annual meeting. You can go to the planetaryhealthalliance.org and I know a uh, professor Maharaj is very active with us and I appreciate that he nominated me for this conversation today. Uh, and then you can participate in different working groups. There can be a, a planetary health campus ambassador. There's internships and opportunities. We have the online community in which we can call the high low. You can participate there, or you can just subscribe to our newsletter and get our most up-to-date information on what planetary health is up to today. So I'll stop there. I'm, I think I'm, at time, and I appreciate the opportunity again. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. My email is here if you want further information. So thank you, Professor Sa, again for, for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ferron, for your very informative talk on planetary health, which is a really burning issue. And as a future health professionals, uh, our students now they will be definitely benefited from this talk and if they have any queries as you have already shared your email also they will be free, free to ask for any queries and dear students you know this is the way now we are talking about a situation as i mentioned in my previous uh, statement in the intro introductory statement that it is not only absence of disease, it is more than that. And it is a, all the planetary forces, they have a serious impact on our health status overall. And on with that note, I would like to express my heartfelt thank to Dr. Ferron for his availability to present this talk. And as you know, he was originally scheduled for Tuesday, but he, because of his busy schedule, we have to reschedule it for today. And despite his busy schedule, he spared some time for us. So on behalf of the faculty and on behalf of the, our university, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ferron. And we'll be looking forward for more opportunity like this. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferran. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. I appreciate it. Uh, Rihanna, we have our next talk. Hi, Prof. And yes, we do. Thank you, Dr. Ferran, again, on behalf of the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Very interesting to know the dangers of palm oil, something that we don't realize how serious it can affect our, our um, eco society and all of that. Up next on our program, we have an overview of the Skills Lab. The Skills Lab is run by the coordinator, Dr. Steve Curry, who I will be introducing next. After having worked in the pediatric department at the Port of Spain General Hospital and Wendy Fitzwilliam Children's Hospital, Dr. Curry moved to the United Kingdom to complete his postgraduate in pediatrics. He worked at various hospitals in London, finally ending up as a lecturer at Imperial College. Good morning um, to, to all and thank you very much, Rihanna, for that introduction of what the Skills Lab is. 
all about. And I have with me Dr. Rafiq um, representing the dental school for dental students. So just, bef nice. just before I proceed, I just want to acknowledge uh, two people, Dr. Hannanan and Dr. Botkin, uh, both of whom were pre um, previous skills lab coordinators and who helped shape skills lab teaching as it is today. Uh, I took over from Dr. Hannanan as of August 1st this year. Um, so what are the aims of the skills lab? Well, it's very simple. It's really to better prepare you, the students, for your clinical years, which are years four and five, by introducing you to the foundation skills of history taking, examination of various systems, um, your ability to communicate with patients under different circumstances, and to be able to um, undertake certain basic procedures that are bread and butter to um, your being able to work as an intern when you eventually qualify. So with regard to the outcomes and skills we'll be teaching you and you hopefully you'll be learning, as I said, the history taking will be confined to the gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, respiratory, and endocrine systems. Um, the, exam the physical examination will be similar. We um, expect you to demonstrate um, the ability to physically examine a patient um, who has cardiovascular, respiratory, abdominal, or neurological issues, particularly the motor systems of the neurological system, as well as to examine things like the shoulder, thyroid, and breast. Um, some of this is done through simulation, and I'll come to that in a little bit. We also would expect you to perform basic life support um, and demonstrate proficiency at that. Um, some procedural skills that are a key for uh, some basic procedural skills that are key for your um, education and practice would be the ability to perform an intramuscular injection, suturing, venipuncture, um, urinary catheterization in both genders, and blood pressure measurement. And finally, to be able to communicate effectively with patients, as I said. And in doing so, to maintain ethical and professional standards, some of which um, would be addressed through your PEC courses, but we will focus a little bit on um, the, the medical side of things. So it, it, there's a school of thought that um, looks at medicine with a capital M as a science and an art. And so as you enter the first three years, you'll be learning the scientific foundation of medical practice. Um, and in the clinical years, you'll be demonstrating the art of medicine. And what Skills Lab hopes to achieve is to actually bridge those two arms and make it as seamless as possible while preparing you for eventual practice. And how do we do that? Um, I'll come to that in a bit. So if we try to integrate it with all your paraclinical sciences and preclinical sciences courses, Skills Lab has now a standalone course of six credits, which means that there is it, it has its own assessment. <clears throat> Excuse me. It starts in year one and finishes in year three. Um, as I said, we map it to the as much as possible to your what you are doing at the time in your pre and power clinical sciences. It takes place on different days between 1 and 5 p.m., depending on what year you are. And for year one, um, it's, that occurs on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, we employ a variety of different teaching strategies, which includes lectures, videos, simulations, and demonstration face-to-face -face once we are allowed to return. You would be divided into smaller groups when that happens. And even in the online lectures, you are divided into smaller groups um, for, 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 for better interaction. So the, the, we use seven principles of, um, of teaching, which are these listed here, uh, conceptualization, visual, visualization, verbalization, practice correction. Hopefully skills mastery and autonomy will come as you enter your clinical years. And what, what we envisage will happen is that you will be taught in stepwise fashion why the skill you're being taught is important. And you go from being taught that skill with the tutor 
telling you everything you need to know about um, executing that skill to you eventually performing that skill. So there's a transition from all tutor-centered to student-centered in terms of demonstrating that skill. In terms of what that translates to in practice, so it's just hope that um, with the recommended textbook, you would read how to do to perform the skill in that textbook. That textbook is associated with videos of the relevant skill, and we will make those available to you. And so you um, read how to do it, see how to do it. Um, it will be demonstrated and reviewed by your tutor when we go back face to face. So we have an opportunity to perform the skill in front of an experienced person and get feedback. In the meantime, while we're waiting on that, it is very highly suggested that where applicable, you practice that skill on a friend or a close friend or relative, of course, maintaining all the protocols that the Ministry of Health has recommended of the three W's. So for semester, for, excuse me, for year one, this is just listed the, the skills that are being taught for this year, for the for um, the online until further notice. And so in semester one, we are introducing you to the basic techniques of history taking um, and examination, basic life support, blood pressure and BMI, which is um, um, body mass index, intramuscular injection and karma skills. And I'll, I'll go, I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And in semester two, these are the skills that we'll be focusing on. Um, in sort of uh, in sort of um, reflective of what you'll be doing in your preclinical and paraclinical sessions at that time. The areas high um, in red font, if, if you can see them, for those skills, dental students are exempt from from those teaching skills and you'll you'll hear more about that um, in a bit. With regard to what karma skills, these are the sort of communication aspect of things. It's karma is an acronym for communication, altruism, leadership, mentorship, ethics, and resilience. And it is a recent module that's been introduced aimed at dealing with some of the more modern challenges that a medical professional faces. And I use the word medical to include all um, healthcare professionals. It's scenario-based and done virtually. At the moment, we have two lecturers running it, and we're hoping to have more B lecturers involved. And some of the issues, this is a list is not exhaustive, would be the Google-informed patient, the patient who relies heavily on social media and what that means for confidentiality, um, LGBTQIA patients and how, how that impacts on on attitude, et cetera, uh, medical legal issues, ethical issues, and um, report and re research. Um, just very briefly, these are some of the skills that we'll be looking at in year two. Um, I, again, the ones in red are actually the ones um, dental students are exempt from. So you can see that there, there's just very few that um, dental students will do in year two. This may be subject to some minor modifications, so please don't take this as absolute. Um, a more definitive program will be given to you when you enter year two. And likewise for year three, oops, um, these are some of the skills uh, where uh, we also focus on some revision, revision sessions for you uh, across all the skills, particularly focusing on the ones that tend to give students most difficulty. So by way of looking at the, um, the significance and contextualizing it, um, we're going to sh just very, very briefly discuss two key scenarios. And for the first um, scenario, I would like to, to invite Dr. Rafiq to, to discuss this one as it pertains to dental students. Dr. Rafiq. Thanks, Dr. Khoury. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be part of the welcome party sort of for the FMS orientation. And we've had quite a few days of heavy and sometimes overwhelming information. But what everyone is trying to orient you to is the actual, you know, treatment of your patient. So even though you're in preclinical, we really want, we introduce you and the faculty at a very early stage to the problem-based learning 
<clears throat> and the case-based learning. So you have a case such as this one, which is quite a, a fairly um, usual scenario for us, a 55-year-old male having a dental extraction. He's diabetic and hypertensive. He's also known to have mitral regurgitation. So that's something with the heart valve and he's having a regurgitation. And he's also on warfarin, which is an anticoagulant or what you would probably just know as a blood thinner at this stage. He stopped his um, warfarin anticoagulation therapy. And during the procedure now, he has now become unresponsive with absent pulses. So this scenario, you may start to worry and panic, but the, the issue with the skills lab and even the dental skills lab that you come into, by the time you have your case, and particularly in dentistry, you start your patients actually in year three, you will be prepared for such a scenario and you will know what we're sort of looking at when you are going through um, a case such as this. So there's so many complex things happening but what your skills lab is going to bring for you is the systems that you would have been focusing on and learning how to manage. So obviously there's some cardiovascular component because he's given you a history with the mitral valve regurgitation. There's some issue with bleeding because he's on blood thinners. And obviously you would have had to deal with blood pressure measurements before you even start any procedure in dentistry and in medicine as well. And of course, unfortunately, the event that has occurred now would trigger you into a basic life support system management, right, which you're going to be trained to do. So it's really to highlight how critical skills lab is, not only for medical students, really the dental students at times ask, you know, why are we doing all these procedures? So it's the foundation for moving forward to managing your patient. And it starts really in year one. All the sort of ethical and professional skills come into play as well but the actual practical skills lab and what you're going to go through from your history taking on to your actual manager and patient really comes into such a simple scenario such as this where an unfortunate event has now occurred so it's really to emphasize that and the um the the sort of different areas that you have to focus on when you get it but don't don't worry about it now you have a lot of information coming at you and it's to show you how the skills lab is going to prepare you for such a scenario. And we have another case as well. I think Dr. Kuri may want to, or I can go through. Dr. Thanks, Dr. Kuri. Rafiq. So I can go through this one if you want me to. So th this is just to illustrate another scenario, more with a, a procedure um, inclination. So you've got a 40-year-old construction worker who falls off a scaffolding and lands on his right shoulder. He's in severe pain and unable to move his arm. He has a deformity of that shoulder with an anterior bulge. He may require surgery. He also sustained a laceration, which is a cut to the fore, his left forearm. So immediately you're seeing some, um, some trauma here, some involvement of his shoulder joint, and he's got a cut that might need a tension, and he may require surgery for that joint. So similar to what Dr. Rafiq was saying in the previous scenario, some of the things that um, skills that would be brought to this scenario would be your ability to examine the shoulder joints and other joints because you can't assume that it is only his shoulder joint involved. Um, because of the laceration, you, he may need suturing. And so that's the skill that you need to bring to this, this um, 40 year old. Um, if, he's, if, he's, if you intend to take him to surgery, he would certainly need an IV inserted and maybe blood, some basic blood tests done, in which case you'd need to, to learn to, to be able to um, undertake venipuncture. And in the process of doing all of this, if you require surgery, and even in terms of how the strategy you are going to employ for managing him, you need to be able to communicate that and you need to be able to consent him for surgery. So as you can see, with this case, you, you, you're now doing some procedural skills um, to be able to conclude um, the case. Moving on then, so I know students are very keen on how they are going to exam be examined. And so you, each year you will have continuous assessments and they each count for 10%. So that's years one, two, and three. And then at the end of year three, you have a final assessment exam, which accounts for 70%. 
The continuous assessments typically consist of an MCQ and um, a mini OSCE, which is about one or two OSCE stations. And more will be communicated to you as time goes on. And whereas the final phase one OSCE, which typically occurs in the March of your year three, um, it varies in the number of stations. And that partly is because of uh, numbers of students as well as what COVID protocols may or may not be in place at the time. And your continuous assessment is provisionally scheduled for April next year. Um, please know that this date is provisional. It's the one that's been given, but things, um, the situation can change. So you will be informed in good time. So with regard to the references that, um, that we suggest, so the McLeod's Clinical Examination textbook, which is the current edition shown here, is the one that is recommended and it's the one that will take you through from year one to year five. And attached to this is a, a, a source of a series of videos demonstrating most of the skills that you'd be expected to, to be familiar with. And so we have made this available and I will make it available on your respective core shell. Um, while that is happening and while you cannot um, practice on a simulated patient or otherwise, we suggest you practice on a friend or relative as I alluded to. And when we are able to return to face-to-face um, -face teaching, we will certainly get you to practice in, in the skills lab itself. So just a, a couple more slides. This is just a, a general floor plan of where Skills Lab is. If you actually um, enter the library and turn to your left, that's where Skills Lab, that's the medical sciences library, and turn to your left, Skills Lab entrance is there. And it consists of five examination rooms and two conference rooms that are divided into five cubicles. That's what the floor plan looks like. In terms of some pictures, so you would actually enter sort of from this end here. And these two doors, uh, behind these two doors are the conference rooms with the cubicles I spoke to you about. And this is just another view of the skills lab. This is taken from the exit door. Um, and this is what a, a examination room looks like. So these, this is one of the five examination rooms. Some other members of the skills lab, except um, apart from myself, is Mrs. Leslie Ann Archibald, who is our secretary, and Mr. Javed Lukail, who is our um, cl clerical assistant. And they're, they're instrumental in, in making sure the skills lab runs very smoothly. Just a, a couple more slides with housekeeping rules. It is expected that you dressed appropriately. You are now a professional and therefore you must act um, dress that way. I'm not um, mandating what you should be wearing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you expect it to wear your student ID at all times. No food or bags are allowed. Uh, cell phones must be switched off. And this is non-negotiable. COVID infection protocols must be strictly followed. And please be guided by the tutors and staff who are present with you, if they say you cannot do that or you should not do that, please refrain from doing it. Um, as per university regulations, you're required to attend at least 75% of all skills lab sessions in order to qualify to take the phase one exams. Switching of groups or rescheduling of classes is not really allowed. We have a large number of students and limited time to facilitate. Um, Certainly, if there are really extenuating circumstances, we will give it consideration. But the groups are already large and trying to reschedule is going to be near impossible. Um, please use the universal uh, 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 skills lab ad uh, email address for any query you might have. It is checked regularly by both myself and Mrs. Archibald and the, the, the address is skills lab at sta.ue.edu. Uh, I think that's it. That was just a really quick overview. Please note that um, a lot of the, the items, the information on these slides is actually been 
um, placed into a document that would be um, uploaded onto my e-learning so that you can review it so um, uh, and or sent to your year rep if you do not have access to my e-learning yet. Any final questions for me or Dr. Rafiq? Okay, Dr. Kuri. So it looks like we have no questions at this point in time, students. Um, this is your last opportunity. Any more questions for the Skills Lab? No? Are the labs online? We have one question, Dr. Kuri. Right. So the, the teaching at present is... Um, is currently online. We are working on getting um, students back into the labs. I know we do have some, some permission um, recently sent from the dean's office with regard to returning to Skills Lab, but initially your sessions are going to be online <clears throat> and then we will bring you into the Skills Lab. Um, for for face to face practice, so bear with us. We just create, we just um, produce the online teaching, and we're working on the face to face. We were waiting on that permission. We didn't have it at the time of publication of the schedule. Um, now that is there, we'll be working on that. So you will be receiving that. We don't want to confuse you too much with regard to too many schedules because it's a lot of schedules that you have to to assimilate. Um, I think with us, I'll just see another question here. Um, yes, so uh, Ms. Carr is actually saying the Skills Lab is scheduled for one to six. We don't usually go in past five. And it's only under exceptional circumstances we go beyond five. And with regard to long sleeve or short sleeve um, lab coat jackets, I would leave that um, up to you. I think a, a, a short sleeve jacket is, is acceptable. There is one more question, Dr. Corey, that for international students, would the skills lab remain online even if it begins face to face? Uh, no, um, we, would ex we would hope that all students would be, be um, attending skills lab face to face. That's why we were pressing for permission to return to face-to-face. -face. So now that we have that permission, we'll be organizing the program and we'll let any international students know um, that we'll be returning. It is unlikely that we'll be returning to face-to-face -to -face for year one this semester. So we are looking at next semester. So there is a little bit of time. Another question, do they have to purchase any equipment? I don't think so. Um, uh, yes and no. Um, no, the Skills Lab tends to provide the necessary equipment, but yes, because if you purchase your equipment, you will have this for the rest of your professional life if you take care of it. And um, so if you can, we do recommend you start getting It's not a lot of equipment. It's basically a stethoscope and a patella hammer. Um, and you, you would need your, your stethoscope for m most specialties throughout years, um, throughout your clinical years, including your yeah. skills lab practice. And with the mini online, with the online mini OSCEs be facilitated, uh, that hasn't been decided yet. My personal feeling is um, it can be done online, and we, I will let you know more about that. Yeah. Um, that, is, that, that, that could be communicated to the students down the line, no problem. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, a stethoscope for dental students as well, Dr. Rafiq might need to answer that one. I think only for the, for the skills lab when they attend, we usually provide on our clinics. So they, okay. may not, they, they may not need it personally, but if they have in skills lab, they may need to, not need to purchase personally. Already provide, and we are in clinics from third year for them, so they'll be seeing me from second year for their dental skills lab portion, just for the dental students. So, 
about block exam all those things dear student i think the you will be definitely notified what type of exam and everything in due course of time when there yes. will be exam so you will be notified with that effect that's yes. so i would like to thank dr rafiq and dr kuri for their comprehensive and well coordinated presentation about the skills lab which is very critical for uh, health professionals in their career so with that thank you i hand over the virtual podium to ms rihana over to you ms rihana thank you thank you prof sir thank you take care guys thank you professor sir special thanks to you dr Yes, my second year. You right. So a special thank you this morning to Dr. Kuri and Dr. Rafiq for that wonderful presentation on the skills lab. It was really, really informative, um, and I'm sure the students appreciated the, the information that they received. Up next, we have a little what we call health break opportunity. As I said, to get up, stretch your legs, have a sip of water. you know get the blood flowing we're not just about sitting all morning long we will resume our program at 11:30 where we will be getting a featured segment on gait and the bursary followed by an introduction to the medical students council which is going to be facilitated by one of our fms students who is the president of the guild for fms ms melissa jack and then this afternoon from 12:30 we have our another feature presentation by dr roshan parasram who i'm sure we are all familiar with our country's chief medical officer so okay everyone it's approximately 11:31 i welcome you back to our orientation session i hope you had a good stretch and up next as i mentioned we're going to feature mrs stephanie loveless who is a senior investigating officer over at the ministry of education good morning mrs loveless good morning riana good morning thank you for being able to facilitate us this morning to inform our students this morning i shall hand over to you now thank you good morning everyone and thank you all for having us here with you this morning we the members of the funding and grants team uh myself and nivel nayas who is the senior investigating officer with responsibility for the means test unit i would like to start this morning by telling you welcome to the gate program but more importantly i would also like to wish you all the best in your academic goals i trust that you are really focused i hope you remain focused in what you're doing medicine given this current pandemic that we're in it is a an extremely intense field but it is you should open up your hearts and your mind to learning learning well my motto is there are no traffic jams in the extra mile students do not be afraid to go the extra mile to be the best that you can be in everything that you do so let's talk a little bit about the gate program many of you might already be familiar with some of the information but i am just here to kind of like give you some additional points and encourage you in the right way um in terms of the gate program what how you can benefit and areas and avenues that you can use to access the program the gate program is a program that is available to citizens of trinidad and tobago it provides financial assistance to persons students who are pursuing approved programs at an approved accredited institution that institution is a tertiary level institution all universities that are approved the program is managed by the funding and grants administration division otherwise known to many of you and will be known by many of you as the gate office we are located on number 16 warner street in st augustine so who qualifies for gate Firstly you must be a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago and 3 years you must be fully accepted into a program of study 
Now, when I say fully accepted, that simply means that you must receive the University of the West Indies um, has several types of terminology that you would see at different points. For example, you would see conditional acceptance. You would see um firm acceptance, you would see different types of acceptance letters. You, the students of the MBBS programs, you are generally fully accepted. And that is the only time that you can then apply for GATE. It is recommended that you apply for GATE only when you are firmly accepted. Provisional, conditional acceptance letters, those are not accepted for gate for an assessment to be done by a gate officer who qualifies for gate someone who has never accessed the gate program before it that might be the case for many of you who are sitting in this room today students over the age of 50 years are also not eligible for gate so once you're under 50 and you have a good clean record, you are fine to go ahead and, and attempt to access the GATE program. So I'm moving on now to talk about persons who will not qualify for GATE. They are recipients of a national scholarship, recipients of a national bursary, recipients of any type of grants that pays tuition, and students who have received funding for another program prior to this year, 2021-2022 academic period. So that then takes me now to something simple as the application form. How do you get to the point of the application form? The first step in this entire process starts with you, the student, accessing TT Connect to receive your e-service ID. It's a registration that is done, and it provides you with an e-service ID that allows you to access the student's portal of the Gate e-service page that will help you to get on to apply for Gate. To do that, the TT Connect has advised us that they are only operating via an online system. So we ask those students who might not have yet received an e-service ID, if you have not yet registered with the TT Connect for your e-service ID, please do so as soon as possible. Visit the TT Connect website. There are links that takes you straight to the information that you are required to submit so that they can then process your information. Now, I am sticking a little point in here for you. Please ensure as a student that the data you provide the TT Connect is correct and clear. I am telling you this because over the past few weeks, what we have found is that there were some errors on student applications or students would have contacted us, informing us that they weren't able to access the system. And that, in our investigation, it would have resulted in incorrect information being input into the system. It might not all totally be student-related, but I am just asking students to ensure that you reconfirm the information that the TT Connect has put onto the system for you. When there are errors, it delays your process. It prevents you from accessing the system to, to, to put in an application. And then it becomes anxious moments for you. We would like you to have a seamless process as possible. And the only way we can do that is if you work with us to help you. Once you receive that e-service ID number, that number then is your number for your life in the GATE program. So that's the ID number. It's an, a number that starts with E, your year of birth, and some random numbers thereafter. Once you use that number, you can log in. You will be given, you would have been given a temporary password. 
You can change that password to whatever you so may desire and then go to fill the application form. We are asking students as well, please refrain from attempting to fill a form using your tablet or your cell phone. We have recognized that it's quite difficult for attachments to load on a cell phone because of the number of different items that you are asked to put up on the application for an assessment to be made. We kindly ask that you ensure that you use a desktop or a laptop computer for filling the application form. Your email address is a critical piece of information. Again, please ensure that it is a correct email address, one that you use frequently, frequently sorry, one that you can that you access, one that does not add you should add gates email to your inbox so that when the emails come to you, it does not go into your junk. From our experience, we have heard that a lot of students give us an email or provide an email, and it's not an email that they use frequently, or they forgot something about the email. So it, 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 it creates more issues for you throughout the process. Now, the gate application process is a simple one, and it is one that ideally would take about a month. But because we have to constantly be clear, we have to, be, we have to ensure that students' information is accurate you would find that there are some cases where we have to keep asking students to provide us with the relevant documents that we need in order to assess your application. I have a few points that I'd like you to just remember and have for your notes. Your registration ID or your registration situation at the university is unrelated to GATE's registration ID. As I would have explained a few seconds ago, your registration ID for GATE is something that is completely related to GATE. However, your ID and your registration situation at the university has nothing to do with GATE. That's a university item. We ask students to contact the university for issues regarding your registration your registration of courses, be it student ID, what have you, that as it relates to the university for guidance in that regard. Holds, as you go through your life in this program, you're gonna be there for some time, five years. At different points in time in the life of a student at the university, holds are placed on your account. The university, from our understanding, carries a number of holes. Yeah. AR holes, gate holes, academic holes, you name it, there are different types of holes. Holes are not placed on a student's account by the gate office. Again, that is an item that is unrelated to gate. It is a matter that should be addressed at the university as your first point of reference before any further action can be taken by the gate office. COVID-19 restrictions, as you all may be aware, we are all working from uh, work from home remotely. We're working remotely. And as a result, we have, uh, are asking students to use the gate.info email to send us your queries so that we can uh, respond to you as quickly as possible. We have some dedicated staff who have been responding to students within a 24, 48 hour timeline. Please bear with us. It's a lot of you and we have, um, we have to work with the system that we are currently working in. Uh, the, we are not seeing the, the public, general public at this point in time, however, uh, we will advise you if there is an absolute need for a student to come into us, we will give you a specific appointment, date and time. Some more points for you to consider. GATE is not mandatory. 
but it really is a grant that is given to students who request our assistance or for funding from the ministry. Students at the University of the West Indies, you are required to apply for GATE funding every semester. Once you do that consistently, you are fine. The GATE process, based on the GATE process, we do our assessment of your application and we determine whether you are eligible, which I will go into a little more detail in a couple seconds. The UNIV at the registration point, the university provides a lot of guidelines because the UE has been very, very vocal with us. We have been communicating extremely well with the university. They have, uh, uh, they carry a lot of guidelines that assist you, the student, during that process between the application of Fogate, between your registration, your application, and all of the other items that you will probably hear about from the bursary uh, who is started to speak for you, to you this morning. Please ensure that you always, always follow up on your GATE application by logging in to your student portal, selecting the view application details, and you will be able to see the status of your application at that point. You will see different statuses. It could be at applied. Applied could mean two things. Either it is pending a verification or it has been automatically cleared and is going direct to the university. It could be at clearance verified, which simply means that your application has been, all of your bio data has been confirmed and it is now ready for the clearance unit to determine whether you are eligible for gate funding. Thereafter, it takes you to the means test point. The means test is used to assess how much funding you will receive. Now, bear in mind what I was saying before, biodata, we determine whether you can receive, whether you will receive funding. If you get to the point where you are not eligible for funding, your application does not go to means test. That there is then an end point for you. Your application, an application that has been clearance rejected means that your application can go no further than there. It is out of the system. Because of the process, the application goes through so many stages Students, I encourage you to, again, contact your bursary before reaching out to the gate office to explain, I need my money, I need my money. Um, the bursary is saying I, I, I am owing. Please contact your bursary, read all of the information, ensure that you are clear on what is being asked of you in an email from the bursary before proceeding to to contact GATE regarding your application that might very well have already been paid or might be in the process of being paid by GATE. So what do we need for the application? What is required? I will point you to the FAQs page. Many of you would have already applied. So you would know by now, and for those who do not know, you need an electronic birth certificate, national ID, both sides, back and front. We want to verify who you say you are or your passport, the bio data page of your passport and your acceptance letter. Now I spoke earlier about the difference between a firm acceptance, a provisional or conditional acceptance. It is critical for you to know that you are firmly, fully accepted into the program of study before applying for GATE. Again, we would like not to have your, your applications delayed further. And, and then it becomes a bit of, um, you become very anxious as a student. For the means test side of that application, there is actually a list of items that you are required to submit when you are, when you are completing your application form. They are all available for you, the student, to see at that point on the means test page. 
They are also available on the FAQs page of the Gate eService. Just for your reference, however, some basic items that you would be required to attach would be salary slip, pension documents such as NIS, letter from organization, etc. If, you if your parents are self-employed or the persons in your household are self-employed, a letter stating such. There are two items I want to bring to your attention in terms of the application process. The first one is a notification that is called correction required. A correction required is sent to a student when there are missing documents, when we need additional information. And this is before you get to the means test stage. When I get to the point on the means test, I will tell you what that notification states. Once that application is, once, sorry, once that correction notification is sent to you, you, the student, have 14 days within which to respond. If you fail to respond to the query that we sent, the application then cancels. A cancellation to you, the student, at a point in time in this first semester simply means that it's an end point for the application and you would be required to reapply. I'm taking you back to the point, your emails. We are kindly asking that you ensure that you check your emails frequently. Ensure that you, you, you provide us with an accurate email address so that when we send these notifications to you, you would receive them in a timely manner and act on it in a timely manner as well. Some more points for you to consider. GATE pays an approved tuition fee and based on your means rate. As we go along, Ms. Niles will probably step in at the end of my talk to just highlight a few points on the means rate if necessary. Issues related to your fees, such as your amenities, your caution fees, outstanding fees, those should be addressed with the university's bursary before speaking to GATE. Financial clearance. Financial clearance is a terminology that is used by the University of the West Indies, and it is given to students based on your approved financial standing. Financial clearance is not an item that relies on GATE, and this is based on the information that we would have received from the bursary. I will allow the bursary in their talk today to explain to you how their entire system has been modified or enhanced to allow students an opportunity to meet their financial commitments. As you go through the program, there's a critical point that you must note, please pay attention to your performance criteria because this weighs very heavily for students who are applying for GATE funding in the successive years. So when you are going into year two, going into year three, year four and year five respectively, you are assessed, critically assessed, based on your performance. I'm not sure if Ms. Niles would like to step in on the means test, but I will continue along the lines because the, the means test, the points that we have to bring out to you on the means test, they're quite simple. Some very important points. One, household income. There's a definition for household income. Household income refers simply to all sources of income within your household as a student. For example, pensions, NIS, salaries, anything that is an income that comes into the household, allowances, etc. Which takes us to the point, what is a household? How do we define the word household? Household refers to 
all persons living within the household, household members. That does not mean parents only. It extends to aunts, uncles, siblings, cousins, or any person living within the home. That, my dear students, are two important points that you need to understand when you are submitting your application for gate funding and you have reached the page that speaks to the means test. Students, you are strongly advised to go through the FAQs section of the GATE website, the GATE e-service page, which directs you in great detail on the means test arm of the page. So I spoke earlier about a correction required notification. I am going to briefly tell you about the means query email. It's similar. It is basically the same thing, except it's under a means query. So when you receive a means query email requesting additional information, you, the student, will be given 14 days within which to respond. Now, we kindly ask students, please respond as quickly as possible to get your means rate confirmed. Failure by any student to respond within that 14 day timeline then places the student in a category to be sanctioned at 50%, at which point in time, and that sanction will be stated on your notification that your application was incomplete. Your means documents were incomplete, something to that effect. But there is something that will always guide you. Now, the point I need to make to you is that once you have been sanctioned at 50%, there's no turning back. You are now required to pay to the university 50% of your tuition fees. Think about it. Think about the cost of your MBBS program, your DVM program, your DDS program, your nursing program, all of the programs under the uh, MBBS, sorry, under the FMS. And you would realize how important and crucial it is for you to provide us with the required information and documents so that we can successfully process your application. Just to highlight before I close that there are many students who would have contacted us and told us they were unaware of the policies that were changed in November of 2020. So I'll just for your information today, I'll just advise you that in November, on November 13th, 2020, new policies were implemented. It was a revision to the GATE and HELP program, mainly the GATE program. I am listing just a few because these are the, the points, these are the policy points that would affect you, young, new students coming into a new program. The first point is, the first policy point is, students are allowed one undergraduate level program only. What does that mean? Either or certificate, diploma, associates, bachelors. You will not be receiving all four levels. You can only receive one program. Please pay close attention to that. The means test is mandatory and it applies to all students. There are some students who might have taken some time off prior to the new policies and they are now coming back into the program. You all need to be aware. You may have colleagues, you may have friends who are in that kind of situation. The means test is mandatory for all students who are applying for GATE funding. The household income, household income above $75,000, the student will not be eligible for gate funding. And finally, postgraduate level programs are no longer funded by gate. 
But there's also one point that I, one policy point that I'd like to bring to your attention before I move on to the final slide that I'm working with. Students who are already in possession of any qualification, be it undergraduate or postgraduate, whether or not they were recipients of the GATE program shall not be eligible for funding for any other program. Those are some of the policy points that I wanted to bring to your attention in this forum so that you would have a very clear picture of how you can move on in terms of accessing your GATE program. The last point on my notes that I would like to bring to you is the point of the Higher Education Loan Program. The Higher Education Loan Program is a low interest loan that is given by the government. It covers non-tuition fees. Well, prior to 2020, it covered non-tuition fees only such as books and rent and that kind of thing. Students can access it at any one of the four major banks, Scotia Bank, Republic Bank, Royal Bank, FCB. It is a loan that is given to assist students who are citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who cannot now access it. So students who are unable, essentially what we are saying to you, if you are unable to access GATE for one reason or the other, or you do not qualify for one reason or the other, you can make an attempt via the banks to access the HELP program. And you will be given all of the guidelines through the HELP program as to how you, what you will qualify for how you can access it, whether you will eventually get any form of assistance and how much assistance you will get. This HELP program is also available to students who are currently approved for GATE funding. So you might have received 50% for some reason for an incomplete program and you are unable to meet the other 50%. You can access the, GATE, the HELP program, sorry, for some assistance in that regard. I do hope that the information that I have provided to you is clear. You, you can understand, you understand everyone. And you are free to contact us via gate.info email. Please, due to COVID restrictions, we are currently closed to the public and staff are working remotely. Students are encouraged to utilize our email option. We are also working on rotation. So there are only a few of us available to respond to a telephone call on any given day. I do wish you all the best in your future studies. And I know I'll be seeing many of you at some point. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Hi, Goody. I have a quick question. Um, I am a transfer student. I was funded by GATE for my previous program, and I transferred in year two. I reimbursed GATE and I reimbursed GATE for all the funds that they paid for my previous program, right? Because I stopped in year two, and then I transferred to pharmacy. Um, Will I be able? Well, right now I am. I am in contact with one of your representatives from Gate. But will I be able to get Gate funding for my pharmacy degree as I reimburse Gate and the university for all that they paid? Well, I can simply answer that as a yes. All right, that's the short answer. However. I would be wrong to give you just a plain yes answer without actually reviewing your entire profile to see exactly what has occurred with your profile. On the surface, based on the information you have given me, um, I'm not seeing that there is too much of a problem. However, again, in order to give you a definitive response, I would like you to probably send me your uh, information, your name, your date of birth, 
and I will do a, a review on your status and I will tell you how you can proceed. I can put my email address in the chat, which will allow you to be able to access. I would send it to Rihanna and she would be able to share it with you. Okay, great. Lovelace. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, Ms. Loveless. I have a similar query. Um, and I just wondered if I can also contact you because I reached out to the gate email in July and they still haven't responded to me. And of course, I've been trying to call the gate office for months and nobody has been responding. So is it okay if I reach out to you because I have her same query? Yes, it is okay for you to reach out to me. I find it very strange that you sent this since July. Right now, we are currently almost, we are at the end of August responses. We are dealing yeah. with August and early September responses. So I would look into it. If you can send me an email. I actually I sent would, it. I would, I would really appreciate I that. Have, I yes, I life. would definitely. Yeah, Ms. Okay. Um, Ramuta Singh would have shared the staff contact listing for the gate office. My name is at, on that listing. You, you all can email me directly and I would look into it. Mind you, I would respond to you all at some weird hours, like three in the morning, four in the morning. Those are my hours. So, but I will respond to you, definitely. Hi, good day, Ms. Hi, Can you hear me? I'm not hearing. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I'm hearing. I'm hearing, yes. Yes, hi, good day, Ms. Loveless. Um, I received provisional acceptance for the MBBS program. And only in applying for GATE, I received the notification earlier this week that I would not be able to receive GATE funding until I get a firm acceptance. And I received provisional acceptance because I'm currently waiting on CSEC physics. That goes on. Yeah. So uh, my question is, would I... If I cancel my current application, would I still be able to qualify for 75% gate funding or would I be forced to pay the 50% when the results okay. come out? Okay. So you asked a two-part question. So I will, I will answer the part about the application and I will allow Ms. Uh, Niles, our means test representative, who's online with us today, to respond to you on the part about the means test, which is the percentage that you're asking. So for a student who was provisionally accepted, safest way to go. Wait until you have been fully accepted and then apply for GATE. Once you continuously apply with a provisional acceptance letter, your application will be rejected. The provisional acceptance letter basically says that you have not been firmly accepted by the university into the program of study. So that's the only time you can apply. And that's the only time you should be encouraged to apply. So I will allow Ms. Niles to respond to you regarding the other part of it. Navelle? I am not seeing her signed in. She's uh, under Marilyn Prince. Okay. Mrs. Niles, are you hearing us? Hearing you? Yes, I am hearing you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. So to respond to the student's question on whether um, if he reapplies, if he would be able to access the same 75% means rate that he got in his previous application. Um, the answer to that is simply providing that there is no change in his household income during the time of these two applications. It is very likely that he may get the 75% that he got in the previous application. Right. So once he submitted the same information, because we can see it in our system. So even though the application may be cancelled, we will be able to access the documents that he uploaded at the time for the means test section. 
And we would be able to compare that with the new application that he submits. And if we see any inconsistencies, of course, we will ask questions. So as long as students, as long as your household income hasn't changed during that period, yes, you may very well still be given the 75% um, means rate. Um, but I wanted to take this opportunity um, because I saw questions, I saw the questions coming in in text message. And a student asks, if you're not living with your parents, what, what do you do? What income do you um, upload? And yes, I want to take this opportunity to guide you once again to the FAQ page. And I'm going to take the time, however, to read it out for you. That not necessarily read it out word for word, but to tell you that if you are not living with your parents and uh, you're, let's say, you're living with your extended family or your grandparents, we will still ask that you provide the income for your parents, right? You all are young students, you're bright, you, are, you have been given this wonderful opportunity to start a medical program and become medical professionals, and we are very happy and proud of you. And we need to see the income of your parents as your support network throughout your journey here. And we will ask that you please provide the income for your parents. If you don't provide it, we will ask you for it and ask for some kind of explanation into your living situation or your circumstances to get a bigger, a better idea of your situation. All right. Um, so, yes. So the answer to that student who asked the question is yes, please provide the documents for your parents as well. Um, on the means queries, this is just one more thing I wanted to say. The means queries, when you are sent a means query, Ms. Lovelace provided excellent information on um, being aware that you may get a means query and the 14 days within which you are required to respond and uh, emphasizing that you sh probably shouldn't take the full 14 days. You should probably, if you receive the query, please do try to respond right away if you can to facilitate, you know, a, a swifter process. We want, to, we want you to have a means rate well before exam period, yes? You want to be able to have a means rate on your application before October, very likely. So we want you to help us in that regard. Um, a lot of students may not be familiar with how to respond to the means query. And for that reason, we send you an email. So yes, please provide us with a correct email address for you that you will be checking. We will provide you with a very detailed email outlining exactly how you are supposed to go about responding to that query via your student gate account, okay? To upload the answers to the query to your gate application, okay? Um, so, and then the final thing I want to say before we go back to questions is that your mean rate is an annual rate. So yes, you're enrolled in a five-year program and you may get 100% in year one. Do not expect that you're going to get 100% in year two, three, four, and five. It is not guaranteed. It is not automatic. Your household income and your situation is assessed annually, every academic year, all right? And you may not get a means query in year one, but you may get it in year two or year three and so on and so forth, okay? So this is an annual, so we're looking at you year by year, all right? right. So, so that's what I would say for now, so you all could um, go back and ask your questions. A question you before you leave, uh, Miss, if I may ask. I'm not leaving, I'm right here, I'm right here. Okay, yeah. um, so, so, this is the guy concerning the provisional acceptance. So what you're saying is that I should not cancel the application within 14 days. I should leave it and let it be automatically cancelled. Well, I don't think... Well, I'll let Ms. Lovelace answer that question. Yes, go ahead. Okay. You, you will not be able to access that application. That You will not be able to access that application to cancel it. The only action you can perform on an application that is in your inbox is to correct the application. If you do not respond, if you do not touch that application for the 14 days, it automatically cancels by the system. So if you are unsure of when you are going to be receiving that firm acceptance into the program, then you will not have anything to provide us with. So you have the option of leaving it to cancel on its own. And then when you have 
received your firm acceptance into your program of study, you can then reapply submit all of the new documents and ensure that everything is clean and clear. Um, and that, that's one option. The other option you have is another option that would, again, put you through a process where you may, if you just don't submit that documentation and you send the application back to us, we will reject it. We will clearance reject the application. Hi, good afternoon, Miss Lovelace. I have a few questions. Okay, so okay let, me just, let me just interject, please. We are running a little bit late on our schedule. Hi. So I'm going to yes. ask all questions from yes. now. Be sent to Mrs. Loveless via email. Student. Email, yes. If you check in the yes. chat, you can see I sent the link. It's on the UE yes. website. All contact information, if you are unable yes. to access it, feel free to let me know. Send it one more time again in our chat. I'd love to ask Mrs. Loveless a lot of questions this morning as it pertains to Kate. And Mrs. Niles, thank you so much for your contribution as well. However, I take this moment to thank you for presenting to our students this morning. And I'm sure you'll be able to answer any questions they send to you. Definitely. Here. Definitely. Thank, thank you. you for always having us. Thank you. Our pleasure. So students, up next on our program, we have two more featured presentations to go. I'm going to introduce to you now a very lovely young lady. She goes by the name of Melissa Jack. She also wears the title of President of the Medical Sciences Student Council. Ms. Jack, are you with us right now? Hi, morning. Yes, I am. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. So I hand over to you to inform our students a bit about the associations. The floor is yours. All right. So thank, thank you for inviting me. So yes, as stated, my name is Melissa Jack. Um, you all would have met me here and there throughout the um, FMS Fest that was hosted by the MSSC. So yes, I am the Guild Faculty of Medical Sciences representative. Um, as well as with that role, I have a dual role of being the chairperson of the Medical Sciences Student Council, right? Um, what that really means is that I am your student representative specifically for the Faculty of Medical Sciences, right? Today I'm tasked with giving you all a little introduction of what the MSSC is, who we are, what we do, and as well also giving you a welcome and congratulations from the MSSC, but by extension, the six student associations, right? This week forms as your official welcome by the faculty, you know, getting your uh, feel of the waters, how the faculty runs. Um, so again, um, I just want to give you all my sincerest congratulations on not just taking the step on, you know, becoming a healthcare profession, but professional, but um, on taking that step, you know, for service, you know, for country, for others, um, not just of self, it's a very noble profession all six of them within the faculty. And I just want to thank you all for, you know, being, being you know, what we want persons to be. Um, just, you know, wholesome persons who are ready to give back to society and, you know, help lift up for the future, right? So um, what is the MSSD? The MSSD is the Medical Sciences Student Council. You will get accustomed to all the um, ton load of abbreviations we have. But the MSS is that umbrella um, representational body within the faculty. Essentially, if you think of an umbrella and under the umbrella, you are there and the student associations are right above you guys, right? The student associations, we have six. We have TTMSA, Trinidad and Tobago Medical Students Association, which is for the medical, um, those who are studying the MBBS program. That they are the ones that represent you. I'll get into the hierarchy a little bit later. We have TTANS, Trinidad and Tobago Association of Nursing Students for the nursing, nursing students. You'd hear it in the name, right? We have TITOSA, um, which is Trinidad and Tobago um, Optometry Students Association, VSAT, which is the Veterinary Students Association of Trinidad and Tobago, and DSAT, which is Dental Student Association of Trinidad and Tobago. So I will call all six. What do they do for you? These associations are basically, if you have a problem with a, um, a certain course, you have questions, you have concerns, even suggestions, because we don't want to only take complaints, you know, we want to know how you want to see the faculty, right? 
you go to your different reps, your student or academic reps. You have you based on which program you're in, you have a, a rep, student rep for your class as well as a deputy rep. So you go to them, you tell them what your issue is, what your concern is, and they will take it on for you. You know, all of our reps are here in service of you all. And, you know, they really just try to make sure that your faculty life is so wholesome, so easygoing. You know, you have zero complaints, zero concerns. You only have suggestions on how to make it better, right? So the reps are really just there doing all that for you. And if they are unsuccessful in your um, complaint, I would say, because the TTMSA reps would deal with the School of Medicine. You know, there's a... Um, a head of the School of Medicine, there's a head of the nursing school, so they will take on your concerns at that specific um, level. If at some point it needs to go further than that, say you, you have a complaint that needs to go to the dean or deputy dean, that's where they come to the MSSC, who is not in charge of one student cohort or group, but in, for the entire faculty. So you would see that the various student associations are in charge of running those day-to-day -day functions of say the medical school, the dental school. And when once the complaint needs to go further than that level, it goes to the MSSC, which will be my committee and where I step in and take your concern either to the dean, to the guild of students, maybe to one of the meetings on the camp, on the actual general campus. Um, or if I need to give it over to the guild president, where he will take it at a, a, a higher level, right? It's important that you remember these, these hierarchy, this flow of communication. Because if you as a student have an issue and you just jump the gun and go straight across everyone, you might, one, be going to the wrong person who cannot assist you, or you might just get your response sent back to you saying, this didn't come through the correct channels. Take it back to step one. So just remember, if you have a problem, go to your student rep first. Then your student rep will guide you along the way onto the next person that can take your concern because if you try to do it on your own, you would realize that you're going around in circles and by something that we could have handled in a week may take you two months because you are going back and forth, back and forth, and then you have to find the same proper um, chain of communication. Um, I know some persons are asking, how can you become student reps? How can you, you know, serve the faculty? So within the first month, I know some groups are already doing it right now, you, you choose your oh, class me. representative. Yeah. That will be done through, say, um, elections. Everything is an um, honest election process. Um, you vote for the person you want to be your um, class representative. When that happens, you, um, that person will be your, your student or academic rep. There's also a position for the MSSC year one student representative, where you will be the, basically your liaison between all the um, representatives, so the year one medical representative, the year one dental representative, so that we have, uh, we continue that cohesive, um, I would say, structure to ensure that we always have some sort of representation along the way. All right. So I would have touched on making sure that you um, give your concerns uh, to the right persons, right? Um, so Another something else I would say is that, you know, this is your faculty life. Yes, it might be online right now, but trust me, even though we're online, there's no such thing as a shortage of events. I just want to encourage you all to make the most of the faculty. The faculty would basically be your home for the next three, four, five years. And you want to make the most of it. You want to make at the end of the, you know, your time here, you have an abundance of memories. These persons in your class will be your family. Don't just stick with in your group, you know, you're, you're studying medicine, so you only talk to medical students, no branch out, talk to the dental students, talk to the pet students, you know, it gives you a different perspective on that term one health and that, you know, how to tackle different issues within the arena of medical sciences. You know, there's a wealth of knowledge that even though you might be studying pharmacy, you, you know, you get a lot to learn if you talk to somebody in vet or dent. It's very exciting talking to persons outside of your specific program and it's a wealth of knowledge, right? We also have um, an abundance of clubs that are doing, you know, they have really adapted to the online environment and have done tremendous events. It's totally great. Um, those who attended FMS Fest would see the type of 
you know, engagement and interaction that we, we were able to get through an online platform. So I just want to encourage you to make the most of your time here, whether it be online or hopefully when we get out there in person, right? Um, I know I have um, until half 12 and I don't want to go too long because, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to just bore you all <laughs> a little bit. So I will just say that as I close, remember that you guys are the future of, you know, the profession. Um, and God forbid we have another pandemic of this sort. You guys are our future frontliners. So take your time here, really study not just to pass an exam that's coming up this week, but study for, you know, the, your future patients, whether it be human or feline patients, you know, they are depending on you and they will be looking up to you guys. You are basically going to be, basically going to be the forerunners of anything that happens in the future. So take, you know, your journey within the faculty very seriously. Um, make sure and take breaks when you need make sure and you know make sure you understand everything that is happening you're here for a purpose and your purpose will be fulfilled at the end of you know um your journey here so um given the current you know global circumstances it will be remiss of me not to mention to you guys that to do whatever you can in order to help the situation you know wear your mask you know social distance get vaccinated definitely um, do what you can to encourage your family, your friends um, to also get vaccinated. Um, definitely, you're, you're, again, I said you're the future of the profession. Do what you can at the moment to curb misinformation. You see your aunt sending some WhatsApp messages. Jump in, the chat, in her chat and say, yo, this, this, isn't, this isn't right, you know, X, Y, Z. You may not have all the answers, but everyone doing something together could help the entire situation. So, again, I want to say congratulations to all of you guys on taking this step. Welcome to the faculty, and we are definitely looking forward to having each and every one of you, I would say, physically someday, and I know that you will enjoy your time here. So, I'm just saying welcome to the future of all six programs within our faculty, and that's all for me today, and I hope you're enjoying the orientation session so far. If you have any questions in the last few minutes, you know you can go ahead and ask. I am actually in all of your um, WhatsApp groups, minus I think Optum started the chat a little bit later. So all of you guys have access to my number. So go ahead and if you have a question, go ahead and message. Some of you all already know that I'm up after one or two in the morning. If you have a question at that time, you know, everyone already feels free to do it. So go ahead and message me. I am very, you know, accessible. So each and every one of you guys, and I just want to make your stay here over the time that I can, you know, very productive and successful. So thanks for the invitation. And if you all have any questions, go ahead and ask them or message me. Thank you very much for that presentation, Melissa. It was very informative. Always a pleasure working with you. I see you're quite popular in our chats as well. Students are already familiarizing themselves with you being such a big leader in the student association. I now invite Professor Sa to come on. Professor Sa is going to introduce our next distinguished speaker. Prof Sa, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I am here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rihana. So, in fact, uh, our next speaker does not need any introduction because almost everyone is familiar with his face. So, just to give a brief overview of his great achievement, Dr. Roshan Parasram who is a physician and public health consultant, is currently the chief medical officer of Trinidad and Tobago. And prior to this, he was a specialist medical officer, insect vector control division, county medical officer of health and district medical officer, and worked throughout the primary care system. In his capacity as CMO, 
he is the national focal point as it relates to the international health regulation a tenure as a quarantine authority of trinidad and tobago currently he is the chairman of multi sectoral committee to treat the covid 19 novel coronavirus and any emergency infectious disease coming to his uh, educational achievement that he completed his bachelor of medicine and surgery at the university of west indies in the st augustine campus and thereafter he went on to complete a post graduate diploma followed by a master of public health both of these being studied for at the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine university of london he also hold a certificate in public procurement law and practice for the in, from the university of york canada and uh, besides that he is also a fellow of royal society of public health london and he also one of our associate lecturer in our department of public health and primary care in the university of west indies st augustine campus and he is the chairman of a more than dozen sub committee at the national level just to name a few drugs advisory committee food advisory committee national drugs advisory committee and many more like that he is the chairman of all at the national level committees and we are pleased to welcome our featured speaker because no other than him will be the better person to speak on the covid 19 at the national and regional status so welcome dr parasram to this virtual podium thank you very much hi good afternoon to everyone thank thanks very much to the university of the west indies um for affording me the opportunity to speak to you all um this afternoon as as you would have heard i am a past member of the faculty of medical sciences and it really um brings me great uh, great privilege to be able to speak to you during your orientation session on the impact of covid in Trinidad and Tobago and at a global and regional level as well um so if i can share my screen i can begin to go straight into my presentation one second so yeah So hopefully you all can see the presentation. Just to get some feedback. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So again, um, so we'll be speaking briefly about the pandemic at a global and regional level, with focus on Trinidad and Tobago. So just to give a background of the presentation, we're looking at the global context first, including the variants of concern and the variants of interest. some regional context caribbean region um afterwards looking at local context in terms of the epidemiological curves that we have become familiar with in trinidad um the parallel healthcare system some vaccination status and progression updates a theory related to our social marketing approach as it relates to vaccination and some lessons learned throughout the pandemic so far so just to give a little background as to where we started with all of this the novel severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus SARS CoV-2 causes coronavirus disease covid-19 it was early on called the novel coronavirus in the early part of 2020 late part of 2019 it began on the 31st of december 2019 as a cluster of viral pneumonia cases in the wuhan wuhan hubei province in the people's republic of china On the 11th of March 2020, WHO declared a COVID-19 a pandemic, and a pandemic really means that it affects three or more WHO regions, and you will see the WHO regions in the future um, slides. And CAFA upgrades Caribbean risks of transmission to very high at that period of time. Prior to that, the CAFA um, organization would have had the Caribbean at low level risk in the late early part of January, February, and in December as well. So on the first of, on the twelfth of March, twenty twenty, we saw our first local case, which was an imported case, 
someone visiting another country and coming back into the country, later developing mild symptoms, flu-like symptoms, and of course, um, testing positive thereafter. He would have been housed in one of the facilities at the Cora Hospital. At that time, we would have had only a four-bedded unit at that facility, which was opened just um, a few days or a few weeks earlier to the, to the country as an isolation unit. To date, we have had 46,283 positive cases over that period of time, with 41,191 of those at this point in time totally recovered. The, the remaining um, persons would be about 3,000 odd persons would have been in um, home isolation and isolation at hospital. To date, the only therapies utilized as treatment options are systemic corticosteroids and interferon um, IL-6 receptor blockers and are recommended to treat COVID-19 infections. So in terms of the global context, where are we with the spread of this disease? So if you look at this slide, you see um, some peaks and troughs going across the, across the way. The different colors represent different regions applied by the World Health Organization. So starting on the top, we are part of a region called the Americas. Below that, in green, there's Europe, there's Southeast Asia, Eastern Mediterranean, Western Pacific, and Africa. So the data suggests so far that the Americas, this region um, captured under the Americas, has the greatest number of confirmed cases so far, 85,254,000. The global burden of cases so far are upwards of 221 million cases confirmed to date, and this is as of yesterday. So situation by WHO region in terms of deaths, we see the, the death rate has now surpassed four and a half million cases. Um, and that, you know, really again, the Americas has been almost um, giving us half of those cases. Predominantly, a lot of it has come from the, the United States of America and Brazil, which you will see in the other slides. Right, the geographic distribution of variants of concern. I know there has been a lot of talk about variants of concern. When we talk about any virus, generally speaking, the longer the virus um, remains in circulation unchecked, you have mutations occurring. And variants of concern are mutations that not only occur, but also have some change the, the characteristics of the virus. So in this case, what you would find is that it's either more transmissible or it can be more um, virulent in terms of the way that it affects people. So more hospitalization, more deaths, those kinds of things. The, the four main variants that we have of concern are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So in the past week, we would have had four new delta cases, um, taking our tally up to 174 countries across the world having delta. Variants of concern again, alpha, beta, Gamma, Delta, and these are the dates on the, on the side where you saw them confirmed by WHO. I won't go into detail about every one, noting that the last variant of concern identified, the B1617.2, originally called the Indian variant, is now named Delta, occurred as a variant of interest first and then a variant of concern on the 11th of May 2021, just a few months ago. Current variants of interest, just for knowledge, the latest one again is the mu variant of interest, which is B1621, um, noted, noted firstly in Colombia in January of 2021. Date of designation, 30th of August 2021, speaks to the date of um, designation by uh, WHO. Our original context, again, just speaking to the Americas. So again, our Americas, in terms of burden of positive cases, account for 38.6 of the global burden of disease. United States, uh, 39,795,201, which is about 18% of the global burden, and Brazil, which accounts for 9.4%. So if you add those two together, you get something in the region of 27%. So the other areas in the Americas, the Americas are made up of the, the South American Peninsula, some of Central America, the Caribbean, as well as the, the Northern American um, part of the world. And the Caribbean forms a small portion of the region of WHO called the Americas. So in terms of the Caribbean region, which is called a sub-region of, of WHO, it is a region of the Pan-American Health Organization, Trinidad and Tobago, shown on the bottom with community transmission, 45,824 cases. 
So again, I'm familiar with this format. This is our daily clinical update that shows the number of cases. It's just to give an idea of what our country looks at at a snapshot. It's supposed to tell you the number of cases, number of hospitalizations, where people are at in different parts of the parallel system. And it also began a few months ago giving us updates in terms of our vaccination status. So if we look at this slide, um, which is basically an epidemiological progression of disease in the country from the 26th of July of 2020, all the way to present, you can see that we were doing, in terms of number of cases, we were at a, later last year, we would have been at a very good rate in terms of daily cases. Coming close to November, December, January, February, our caseload was very low. We had gotten to a point in late February, early March, where our daily um, rates were in the region of three, four cases per day. Subsequent to that, if you begin looking at the right-hand side, where you see the orange bars and then subsequently the purple bars, which are April, you would have seen a, 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 a sharp incline occurring. And that is related to what we think is the introduction of the P1 variant. So variants of concern, as I said before, um, P1 is gamma. So you see that what happened is that with our public health measures in place, masking in public spaces and all of that, we were able to contain very well until the end of February. What happened in the latter part of March and April as well is that there was a, there was a holiday break as well. You would have found there was a lot of congregation going on, but we think that there was an introduction of, to a large extent, P1 into the country, which is twice as transmissible as the original Wuhan strain, and it led to that spike going up very quickly, taking us into May and then into July, into June and July thereafter, which are the blue and the pink parts of the graph thereafter. What we began to see coming up to the middle of July is that the, the vaccination, and I'll show the rates as we go forward, in the country began to keep pace to some extent with the increasing number of cases. So we began to see the impact of the vaccination program. Once we crossed about 20% of the vaccination, um, persons being vaccinated, we started to see the impact of that on the transmission of disease. So one of the, one of the things that we have um, talked about a lot in, this, in the country is the parallel healthcare system. And what it is basically is trying to create a healthcare, healthcare facilities which are separate and apart um, from the regular health, um, health centers and hospitals. And in that way, keeping the infection out of the general system means that you don't have add to the burden of infectious disease being present in a non-infectious scenario. So we had created 18 facilities over time, nine hospitals, nine step-down facilities, having about just over a thousand beds, designated beds between Trinidad and Tobago and 13 designated state supervised quarantine facilities so that we could have housed while the border was closed and even now persons coming through the border not meeting the, the requirements for home quarantine or to go home directly from the airport or seaport. So this, this is just a list of the various sites that we have hospitals at. The Hoover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility is our largest facility, um, followed by the Cora Hospital and Augustus Long, St. Anne's Hospital, Arima General Hospital, Point Fortin Hospital, St. James Medical Complex, Scarborough Regional Hospital at Fort King George, Scarborough General Hospital are the main hospital facilities within the system. We had a step-down listing of facilities on the right. And what we mean by step-down is step-down in the level of clinical care delivered at these sites. So generally what we did is persons who had milder symptoms, either on, on admission or awaiting discharge, we, we cleared up some of the hospital space, which is a more acute level care for those individuals and left the step-down facilities for people who are ambulant, being able to walk around and needing um, less oxygen so that we could support them on the way either to home or when they come off um, home isolation so that they could be given some level, mild level of care before they are discharged again into uh, back into home. Right, so the parallel has a system at a not in a, at a glance. Trinidad and Tobago, the ward level beds are 916, the ICU beds 50, HDU beds 56, giving us a total of 1022. So the breakdown again um, Trinidad ward 815, ICU 45, HDU 56, total of 916, 106 beds in total at Tobago, 
the majority of those are ward level with 101 beds and five ICU spaces. There are no HDU type units in Tobago. Right? Just as I wouldn't go through the entire list of hotels, but these are the hotels that we have used throughout the, um, the pandemic to have persons housed as they came through the borders. Um, in the first instance, they were staying 14 days and having a, a test done at day seven and day, day 12, I believe. And that would have transitioned over time based on immunization, vaccination status, and other things, so that persons are able to go home at this point in time. Some people who are unvaccinated still require state supervised quarantine facilities. Right? The vaccinations have made a big difference in the country and in the world. We all have um, waited for vaccines to become available. The first vaccine, which is the Pfizer vaccine, to be authorized by WHO and receive what we call emergency use license and unauthorization, was approved on the 31st of December 2020. And it gave the world a ray of hope in a short space of time that vaccines were being developed. And we don't have to, and we could have moved forward into a new phase of managing this pandemic and the epidemic in our various countries. So at this point in time, Trinidad does have at its disposal, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, which is the second vaccine to receive EUL on the 15th of February. We have the Sinopharm vaccine, which received EUL on the 7th of May, and the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine on the 12th of March was approved. It's, a, it's the only single dose vaccine that has been approved thus far. So in terms of our mobilization strategy, once we had enough vaccines in hand, we decided to increase the number of sites to give us access to the public. So as you would have seen, we rolled out different types of vaccines to different sites at different times. For now, we have 109 health centers. We have 10 mass vac sites. We have six drive throughs and about 93 sentinel positions. And what sentinel positions are, are persons in the private sector who have a long-standing relationship with the Ministry of Health. So they would have been getting childhood vaccines, for example, and they give us back um, surveillance data as well um, so that we have a sense of what is going on in both the public and private sector through the engagement of sentinel physicians. Of course, we have the use of caravans, the use of educational institutions for the school-age children, sports facilities, malls, churches, home visits, prisons, door-to-door -door regional complexes. So we're trying to have access in as many places as possible to make it easy to the public to access the vaccines. Again, this is just on a map, a geographic dispersion of what we have before us. So on the left, you can see the health centers, 109 health centers. On the right, you can see the nitrogen sentinel physicians. You can see drive shoe sites. You can see mass vaccination sites depicted on the, 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 um, the pictorial on the right hand side. So in terms of our acquisition of vaccines, this would just give you a sort of at a glance using the um, flags of various countries to see where we would have gotten our supply from. Starting on the left-hand side, we look at February 11th, Barbados donates 2,000 AstraZeneca. We saw our first COVAX shipment in the, on the 30th of March, which was 33,600 AstraZeneca shipment. And we keep going all the way down um, until we got a large shipment from China which is our first large shipment. On the 13th of July, there was 800,000 doses of Sinopharm from China received, and we were really able to push forward in our mass vaccination drive since. So if you look at the right-hand side, you will see in the little box below, total vaccines received to date by different brands, 277,200 AstraZeneca, Pfizer 305,770, the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, 108,000, and Sinopharm, 1,105,000. So total number of vaccines received, 1,795,990. And total number of vaccines administered so far, now stand at 953,117, the majority of which would have been given out um, in July and August, in those months where we were able to set up mass vaccine campaigns. So vaccination status of the population to date, 532,484. Our first dose is standard 38% of the population. And our fully vaccinated, which is either one dose of the Johnson & Johnson or second dose of the two-dose vaccines, now standard 420,686. 
which is about 30%. And what we see by the end of September, we expect that first dose to become the second dose figure. So let us hope that close to the end of September, we'll be close to 40% vaccination as a population and will put us in a much better place to deal with variants of concern as they come in. We're looking at the school, um, school cohort as a separate entity. 91,000 children. Um, 31,959 children have been given the doses, first doses of Pfizer so far, taking us of 35.12% of the school age children. If you remember, our, our goal was to actually bring those children who are fully vaccinated back out to school to begin face-to-face -face learning in October as a sort of safe zone for those children. Um, and virtual learning, of course, will continue otherwise. This, this graph superimposes the cases in the bars over the number of doses of vaccines. And you see from July or so, we become, we're going into a plateau. Um, just to bear in mind, what we did as well is we continued to open the economy. So there was a large increase in the number of people that were moving. Although we increased the number of people moving into the country, uh, moving in the country at any given period of time, we saw that plateau being maintained, and that is more than likely due to the impact of the vaccination program in the country. So just to, to as I discussed, the diffusion of innovation theory, it's a, a social marketing approach when you into um, bring any intervention into a population, you can look at these different categories of people. And this historically and through research, we have found out that this is to be um, noted to be true in many interventions that occurred in the past, health and otherwise. So, for example, it, it tells us that if you start on the left, persons who accept that intervention, that vaccination early on will be innovators. So the first 2.5% of, of persons will, will accept whatever intervention you're applying very quickly. Um, the next 185 are what we call early adopters in green. Then we go into early majority and those first three bars, the innovators, the early adopters and the early majority tend to generally accept any new intervention um, fairly easily. So you make the intervention available, for example, vaccination, make it widely available to them, ease of access. You find that that first 50% of the, of the people would tend to accept it very quickly. And what we have seen, although our numbers are 38% of the overall population, more or less we are close to 50% um, of the adult population being at least receiving at least one dose. So our adult population in Trinidad is about a million people. We are close to about 50%. So if you look at the diffusion of innovation theory, you see that 50, we have reached around 50%. So we go into the late majority of persons who we have to target and our public education campaign needs to change gears in order to get to that group of people. And of course, the last 15% on the, on the blue going down on the right-hand side of the bell curve speaks to something we call the laggards. Those people are very difficult to change their mind. They tend not to want to take any new innovations um, very readily and they're very skeptical about any, any change to the status quo. So those people, we really have to work very hard and that's where mandates and mandatory ma mandatory vaccination comes into being um, in other populations around the world. And when you're trying to get to groups that are very resistant to change. So trying to close it all up, um, just to give you some idea of the lessons learned during the parallel healthcare system, of course, is one of our major benefits to the country and it continues to operate simultaneously as the regular healthcare system and give us that buffer in terms of infectious disease spread. It's essential to minimize the risk to other patients as well and to maintain that ability to function with, with the other system um, still going ahead, although we have cases, large number of cases of COVID-19 in the system. Um, what it does cause is a significant resource um, strain on the system because we have to pull a lot of capacity from the existing system and put it into that system. So it requires a large number of resources. In Trinidad, we had at our, at our disposal earlier on the, the Cuba Hospital, the Arima General Hospital, the Point Fortin Hospital, which were all new hospitals waiting to be opened, which is a very good asset to have at a time like this. The establishment and expansion of SARS-CoV testing, which was a national testing. So we were able to use our national testing criteria. Early on, we were hampered by having to abide by the CAFA testing criteria and their capacity. 
So our national capacity increased as we increased our testing capacity. There's a difficult balance between public safety versus socioeconomic interest. Um, calculated risk must be taken based on the public health um, interventions, the way the disease spreads from person to person, and all other scenarios. Of course, from a health perspective, we make our recommendations, and other arms of government will have a say as well as to what happens in terms of our um, measured outcome. Evidence-based policy and the foundation of strategic responses are based on the fact that we do have evidence. Um, our quarantine policy, for example, is guided um, by historic evidence in Trinidad and other parts of the world as to what proportion of persons would have been testing positive based on different scenarios, for example, vaccination, having a PCR before they come and those sorts of things. Strengthen surveillance systems, foundation of evidence-based response again. So you really need to have a very strong surveillance system to pick up diseases earlier to track them, to treat them, to isolate, and then, of course, to decrease the risk of spread in a wider, a wider area. Human resource capacity is something that is finite in a lot of Caribbean states, small island developing states, and it requires sometimes that you pull resources from other countries. We have imported into the country healthcare professionals from Cuban, um, from the Cuban um, Republic of Cuba and other places to augment our supply. Redistribution of staff to the parallel healthcare system I spoke about before. Evolving treatment and care, public health protocols, the use of technology to enhance healthcare system. For example, we began to use the telemedicine initiatives, which is persons calling someone um, who has an NCD like diabetes um, to check on them at home. And we have also used it for persons who are positive to check and see if they are well twice a day. Um, looking at their oxygen saturation levels and those kinds of things. Workplace policies would change over time. We have moved towards virtual meetings, flexi time. This um, presentation, I think, a few years ago would have been done in person. We would have had an auditorium full of students looking on. So this is being done virtually. And I think public health has changed because of COVID-19 going forward for a long time to come. The supply chain management and vaccines are critical and we need to always keep an eye on, on our personal protective equipment. These things have been in short supply across the world, especially in the early part of the pandemic. And we really need to keep a very close eye on it to ensure that we have good supplies for our country. Um, and we have so far managed to keep the, the personal protective equipment and other critical um, drugs and, and non-pharmaceutical items in good stock in Trinidad and Tobago. Collaboration is essential both internally and with the Pan-American Health Organization, external agencies, other countries in the CARICOM region, and of course the world. And legislation, the use of the public health regulations has been um, used extensively throughout the, the pandemic to good effect. And of course, as you know, there's still a mandatory mask use policy in place, which is legislated um, that you have to wear masking in public. That's just an example of how we use legislation for public health good. All right, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, I suppose I can take them up. Thank you very much, Dr. Parasram, for your very much informative and authoritative presentation on COVID-19 situation in the country. And I would like now to invite any questions and comments from our audience. I see one question here. Is there a social media platform where we can get this information? Yeah, um, so the Ministry of Health would have a Facebook page. I believe there's on the Ministry of Health website as well, there's this information that is posted on a daily basis relating to our dashboards. So that is available there as well. Um, so those are the two areas. So Facebook at the Ministry of Health and on our web page as well, you can get that information. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, sharing that information. And I am seeing a lot of uh, congratulatory and thank you message for Dr. Parasram for very much informative presentation here for you on our chat. And do we have any other question? So in the absence of any other questions for Dr. Parasram, I would like to thank on behalf of the Dean, on behalf of the faculty and university at large for his 
informative presentation for our year one students who are basically our health professionals that way they are very much critical and with that again once again i express my heartfelt thanks to dr parashram for his time we know that he is quite busy and for his for your time and for making yourself available for our orientation week dr parashram thank you so much and thank you very much for inviting me and i always remember my days at the faculty of medical sciences very fondly um yeah. and you know always make me time to share with the students and the healthcare workers of the future we really um you all are our future and we really stand on the back of your foundation so um i will happy always be happy to to share whatever i have with you all thank, thank you for the invite thank you and we'll be looking forward for a future uh, events also with you okay now i will hand over our virtual platform to rihana to take over from here and update our students about the future activities and conclude the session for tomorrow rihana over to you thank you thank you professor sir thank you dr parasram students this concludes the end of today's session I hope you guys enjoyed it. We tried to diversify the topics as much as we can without overloading you guys with information. Um, please bear in mind that from time to time we send out survey links, and these survey links will take a brief moment to complete, just to let us know how you find the orientation experience has been thus far. As I mentioned earlier, those persons who have not received a copy of the orientation schedule, it is on the FMS website, and there is a link to the survey on that PDF. Okay, so. tomorrow afternoon after all sessions are completed i once again ask you if you can just kindly take a moment to complete our online survey tomorrow we're going to focus a lot of our presentations on ethics and professionalism we all know how important it is to be ethical especially in your profession for which you are studying dealing with the public at large dealing with lots of persons and what we're going to do tomorrow is have our breakout sessions and these are going to be the different zoom rooms that you would be invited to go into based on your program For example, we have a session for MBBS students, a session for dental students, veterinary students, etc. So tomorrow morning we meet again at nine a.m. Do we have any more questions for the day? Um, I don't think so. Give you guys one minute. I know the information from Gate was very overwhelming. So, like I said, I was sorry to cut off persons. but you can have access to their information and email addresses on the website or the link that i sent in the chat i'll send it one more time again in case you missed it right now please remember something to note the students who have holes on their accounts and have not yet received academic advising i ask you to just please be patient the administrative assistants at each of our schools are responsible to organize academic advising um so they will reach out to you when they have a moment to set up an appointment and they will be in touch with you right so i just ask for your patience with that i would also like to take a moment to thank our division of student services and development they have been very instrumental this week so far in all of our orientation preparations it is not an easy task to go virtual but it has been quite successful especially we have these orientation sessions in our amphitheater which one day hopefully you will get to visit for now you can head over to the chat and complete the survey um about the orientation sessions for the new st- um students mrs dyaram from the division of student services has just sent the link right um bearing that i have no other questions if you do have questions you can send it to me to my email address i will type in my email address one more time in the chat for persons who may not have received it Of course, I can answer a lot of questions pertaining to the MBBS curriculum. However, if you are a dental student 
or a nursing student or a pharmacy student, optometry student, uh, veterinary medical sciences student, you are directing, you are going to be redirected to the administrative assistant at that school, okay? I can assist for medical sciences for the MBBS program. So once again, I put my chat in the chat, my email address, and I take this moment to wish everybody a safe afternoon. As Dr. Parashram said, remember to keep safe, wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, you know the drill. Thank you and take care.